How do you define a masterpiece? Is it merely just a measure of quality, or is there something else that separates it from the norm? I guess it's really up to the individual to decide. Breath of the Wild has been praised by everyone as a modern masterpiece, video game outlets praising it for a variety of different reasons and those who call it overrated, whilst giving valid criticisms of the game are mostly rooted in the hype that surrounded it. It is easily the most influential Zelda game, heck, the most influential Nintendo game since Ocarina of Time. And yet, that isn't why I would consider it a masterpiece. Good game design has nothing to do with how I view Breath of the Wild. It's not my favorite game ever made, not even my favorite Zelda, but to say that it isn't special, or that it still doesn't have some of that same magic that was there when I first played the game five years ago, would be unfair if I were to under-exaggerate a bit. If I were to condense this several hour long critique into one short summary at the beginning of the video, it would be that, while not my favorite, Breath of the Wild is the game that I am the most passionate about. There's a lot to talk about, and unlike my previous Zelda videos, I will not be holding back anything. I will be going into excruciating detail over every single element of this game that I deem worthy enough to add to the discussion. The only game that I will be leaving out is the Wii U version of the game, mostly because I've never played it, and I never will. With all that said and done, grab some popcorn and a drink, and let's begin this Breath of the Wild retrospective. What is Breath of the Wild's focus? You may say that it's exploration, but that's really not the case since it was also a focus with games like The Wind Waker. It's also not really about breaking the conventions of Zelda, that was more of a catalyst than anything. The one thing that Breath of the Wild exceeds at, and arguably its main focus, is player choice. Let me give you an example. The final boss of the game allows you to use either the Bow of Light, which has infinite ammo and no drawbacks to using it whatsoever, or you can use the Ancient Arrows. I discovered this on one of my earlier playthroughs when I believed that I had switched to the Bow of Light, but was actually just using the same bow and arrows that I had been using previously. There are no real benefits to using Ancient Arrows over the Light Arrows, but the fact that even now, at the end of the adventure, you still get to make a choice in what weapon you use shows how much the game still respects the person playing. At no point are you forced to do something in a way that you don't want to do it. The reason that I'm getting this out of the way is because the vast majority of my criticisms and praises of the game rest on this fundamental concept of player freedom. There's also a secondary focus of the game that sort of underpins this concept, that being discovery. This is why a first playthrough is always the most special, it's because you never know what you're gonna find. There's always something across the river or across the mountain and all it takes is a little bit of hard work to cross it. I wouldn't say that it's the main idea of the game, since subsequent playthroughs are far less special than the first, but the game isn't suddenly worse because of it. With that out of the way, let's talk about how the video is structured, just in case you don't have 5 hours to spend watching the entire thing in one sitting. The next 9 of the main body sections of the video will focus on one specific area of the game, however this one is more focused on some of the important mechanics that the game is built around. So, while skipping around won't be too detrimental, a lot of the foundations are going to be laid in this section, so I would recommend watching this one before thinking about skipping around. Some things like the rune abilities will be saved for a later section where I feel it's more appropriate and convenient to talk about. When talking about the visuals, the real nitty gritty technical stuff, the game looks fine. There are a few times where the frame rate will drop, particularly in heavily populated areas like Korok Forest. Generally speaking, I don't really mind the poor frame rate in these areas since you're never in any real danger. What's a little more distracting than this is some of the pop-in. Enemy pop-in is generally fine since you can see them from a far enough distance that you can decide whether or not you want to engage in combat with them. And since they're so small, when they do just randomly show up, it's not that bad. There is, however, one notable exception to this. Hinoxes will only show up when you're super close to them, so the only way to make their fights feel less cheap is to make it take a little more effort to wake them up, as it's the only real way of preventing unfair deaths. 
some foliage spawns in, but that's kind of to be expected. Uh, one thing that's really odd to see is geometry pop in. In order to keep the flow of being able to go from one end of the map to another with no load time seamlessly, there are low poly versions of the landscape to make it easier on the system. However, suddenly going from a low quality version to a high quality version is fairly sudden and looks really off. It just takes me out of it, you know? At least when playing in docked mode. For some reason, the game runs pretty much perfectly in handheld mode. Sure, Quark Forest still lags a bit, but it is nowhere near as bad as it is when docked. Even more shocking, when lowering the TV resolution, forcing it to output at 720p, didn't help performance at all. Heck, I even tried 480p, and even though it did run about as well as it did in handheld mode, who the frick wants to be playing this game in standard definition, ew? The only thing that makes sense to me is that when the higher-ups at Nintendo sent them that email, they decided that since it was a hybrid console that people would most likely be playing in handheld mode at launch, they put more effort into optimizing it for handheld play, with dog mode having less effort put into it. I obviously don't know if this was the case, but it makes sense to me. More evidence can be found in the trailer for the Breath of the Wild sequel that we got at E3 last year. The game is clearly being played in docked mode at a higher resolution and frame rate, plus it just flat out looks better. Perhaps they couldn't get the game's performance to be at its peak because of the porting job, but I guess we'll never know. Now disregard everything that I've just said because holy moly does this game look freaking gorgeous. The lighting is sublime, I love that grass shine that happens whenever the light hits it, the way that the towers and shrines all affect the water when they're glowing, leaving a trail of orange or blue depending on whether or not you've cleared it, it's just so cool. The character designs are all fantastic, Zoras look more like fish, Ritos are actually birds this time around, the whole game does a great job at blending the Wind Waker cell shading and Twilight Princess's realism. It's one of the first ways in which this game takes an element of Skyward Sword and improves or adapts it. Another way it does that is with ancient technology. First of all, I love the idea that this technology is super old and these people who have never experienced it have discovered it after 10,000 years. I feel like this makes it fit into the series as a whole a lot better. I think that it pulls it off a lot better than its predecessor too, since that game was focused on being an origin story for the series, yeah there are a bunch of cool robots that utilize technology that you never see again after that point. Here though, it's perfect and baked into the very identity of the game and its story. The designs are also really cool, the guardians are large and intimidating, towers and shrines stick out like sore thumb, meaning that no matter where you are, you can immediately tell what it is you're looking at. I also love that everything has a sense of logic to it. Whenever you get a ball, you can see the shaft that it comes out of, nothing just appears. You can kind of make out how everything works in every single shrine, which just makes the world more believable and immersive. Shrine's interiors are so visually distinct from nature that it feels like you're stepping into another world. This game also happens to have my favorite enemy designs in the entire series. They all look like actual creatures that inhabit the world, and not just mindless beasts that serve under Ganon. This game is so artistically stunning that it makes up for every single graphical shortcoming. Would I have liked if the game ran better and didn't have distracting pop in? Sure, but at the end of the day, the game has such an amazing art style that I couldn't care less. The music in this game is one of the few areas where I am a massive contrarian. I absolutely love this soundtrack, so when people make a bunch of stupid claims, it annoys me. One sentiment that I've seen is that the music is just a bunch of random notes on the piano. I don't care if it's just a joke, since I've seen so many people over the years say the same thing, at least 100, give or take a few, and I find it hard to believe it was just one guy. <laughs> So I prepared a quick example of what random notes being played on the piano actually sounds like. As you can tell, that sounded really bad. The music that's being played actually sounds good. Now that that's out of the way, this is Breath of the Wild's overworld theme.
It's fairly different from the adventurous feelings of Ocarina of Time and Skyward Sword. Different from whatever emotion Terminator Field was trying to strike. It's honestly the weakest overall theme in the series since it just feels like music for the sake of it, but whatever. It also lacks the qualities that evoke curiosity, like in The Wind Waker or Twilight Princess. Instead, it just kind of wanders. doesn't really go anywhere, but it does move. Keep in mind that I have no idea what the frick I'm talking about. I mean, music theory, what is that? MatPat's new channel? <laughs> there are a few different ambient tracks in the game that I really enjoy, like Waterfront or Castle Town Ruins. However, my two favorite ambient tracks are the Mountains theme, which was the first piece of music that we ever heard for the game. I just think that it really fits and it's a super nice song to just put on in the background. However, my favorite piece of ambient music in the game is the cave theme, the way that the piano and synth combine, representing the natural beauty of the cave and the technology that lights deep inside, along with a very soothing melody, makes it oddly nostalgic for me. I guess it's not that odd, considering that it's five years old, geez, where does the time go? However, these ambient tracks don't actually make up the whole soundtrack, since several tracks fit with the whole classic Zelda music category. I made a list just to show that this game does indeed have some real bangers. They are in alphabetical order. Attack on Vameto, Attack on Vondoboros, Attack on Varuda, Blight Ganon Fight theme, Dark Beast Ganon Fight, Daruk's theme, Encounter with the Great Deku Tree, Gerudo Town Day, Gerudo Town Night, Goron City Day, Goron City Night, Great Fairy Fountain, Guardian Battle, Hateno Village Day, Hateno Village Night, Hyrule Castle Exterior, Hyrule Castle Interior, Kakariko Village Day, Kakariko Village Night, Cass's Theme, Korok Forest Day, Korok Forest Night, Lurinland Village Day, Lurinland Village Night, Melania's Theme, Mifa's Theme, Parasailing, Rivali's Theme, Rito Village Day, Rito Village Night, Shrine Theme, Stables, Terrytown, Herbosa's Theme, Avameto, Avana Boris, Avarudania, Avaruda, Yika Clan Hideout, Zora's Domain Day, and Zora's Domain Night. The thing with this game is that these themes are far and few between, so whenever a more prominent piece of music plays, you know that something special is happening. I'm not even a big fan of some of these pieces. Gerudo Town Day, Hyrule Castle Interior, and both Zora's Domain pieces aren't really up my alley. But to say that just because I don't like a few pieces means that the whole soundtrack sucks is a bit stupid. Now you might have noticed that I missed two pieces, and it's because I have a little bit more to say about them in particular. Firstly, the main theme. It's probably my favorite piece of music in the entire series. It fits so well with the main ideas of the game, and I love how it uses almost every instrument from the rest of the game. The only real issue that I have with it is the pause in the middle of the song. And I mean, yeah, they did say in an interview that it was supposed to represent Link's first breath after waking up the Shrine of Resurrection, which is cool and all, but this pause sounds so unnatural and ugly. Here's an example from the 2018 Zelda concert, which I feel utilizes the pause better. You could argue that the original piece uses it to show how sudden and out of nowhere it was or whatever, but I personally prefer the natural fade before slamming into the more energetic part of the song since it's like Hyrule is on the edge of its seat, waiting for this moment when the hero finally wakes up. Or maybe I'm looking into this too much, who knows. The other theme that I failed to mention is the battle theme. It's easily the best in the series, starting off non-intrusive and it's dynamic, with the mood always changing. Now I'm not going to pretend that I discovered this next thing that I'm about to bring up. I discovered it whilst watching some Breath of the Wild music analysis video that I can't seem to find for the life of me. It was voiced by Masked Nintendo Bandit and that's all I remember about it. Anyway, whenever you land a hit, the battle theme has a percussion hit, but not when you actually landed the attack, but rather when the next beat of the song is. That attention to detail is just insane to me, and it really has the chaotic feel that the piece is going for. And this brings us to the next point of discussion, the combat. 
Zelda games have never really had the best fighting mechanics. It was always the least enjoyable part of the game from a casual playthrough perspective. Fighting enemies was never really a challenge, and your options were always so limited that it made every combat encounter feel the same. The first two N64 games established combat, and it's forgivable considering that they were pioneers. Wind Waker introduced a parry system that really wasn't that enjoyable since it was timing based and you couldn't do it yourself. It was only ever really useful on more powerful enemies, essentially meaning that the game didn't allow you to have the fun of using on any enemy that it didn't choose. Twilight Princess was a step in the right direction, with a bunch of cool moves that you could perform at will, though combat was so easy due to enemy AI that it made them feel a bit more worthless on anything that wasn't a Dark Nut. Skyward Sword had some pretty enjoyable combat encounters, however something that I failed to mention previously was that everything is based on directional swings, so even if everything was fun and engaging, it still lacked depth due to how limiting working with only one direction is. Breath of the Wild finally took a proper step in improving the combat. First of all, due to the weapons breaking system, which I'll get to in a bit, forces you to use a variety of weapons. There are spears, two-handed weapons, and single-handed weapons. They all have the same basic controls, but they all feel different to use. Spears are generally best for ranged combat. Two-handed weapons like large swords or axes are slow to swing but do heavy damage, and single-handed weapons are a bit more balanced and are the only weapon that lets you use your shield. You can also parry and the window is relatively small, unlike Skyward Sword, which was far too forgiving. There are also flurry rushes, and to be honest, I really don't see what the big deal is. A lot of people say that it ruins combat because it's too easy to perform. Look, I'm sorry that you being good at a video game ruins it for you. The timing is actually pretty strict. There are multiple times where I've dodged, but it was never in that perfect window, so I didn't get it. The timing is so strict that it's always satisfying to perform. It's this bullet time mode that really makes the combat so much fun, and since you can enter it when you have your bow out too, it makes the combat approachable in a variety of ways. What there isn't much variety of is enemies. See what I did there? Honestly, there's a bare minimum amount of enemy types. I would like more, but I don't think that there isn't enough in the game. You're pretty much limited to the basics. Bacoblins, Moblins, Azolfos, the skeleton versions of them that only come out at night. Keys, elemental keys like electric or ice, choo choos who also have elemental variations like keys, and whiz robes who once again have elemental versions. There are also bosses, which we'll get into way later on, but there are also guardians, mostly located in the central Hyrule area. There are a few different types, with the most notable being the stalkers. They are absolutely terrifying in the early game. They're fast and can easily fire lasers at you, and so you'll just kinda have to hope that you can escape if you get spotted by one. Later on in the game, they become a lot easier to defeat, which is pretty satisfying given how difficult they were in the early game. There are the Skywatchers, which there are relatively few of, and they're a lot easier to escape from than regular Guardians, and defeating them takes a bit longer too. There are Decayed Guardians, which are mostly just there to keep you on your toes whenever you're near some ruins, since you'll never know if it's alive. There are also the Stationary Guardians that are only found in Hyrule Castle, at least to my knowledge. They're basically just more powerful versions of the Decayed Guardians. Inside of shrines is Guardian Scouts, the more powerful ones being saved for the Test of Strength shrines. Whenever just randomly thinking about the enemy variety, it does feel like there is a very small pool to pick from, but when laying it out like this, yeah, there's a lot more in this game than I feel like a lot of people, myself included, give it credit for. So far, I've been relatively positive, but that's about to end. Difficulty progression is one of my biggest problems with this game. It starts out pretty difficult, you only really have access to weak weapons, so you need to pick your fights carefully. A lot of the world is really difficult to access at this point in the game, so there are really only a couple of regions that you can safely traverse through. As the game progresses and you get cooler weapons that do more damage, more hearts, more stamina, the more the world opens up to you. This is pretty much the only positive thing that I have to say about the progression. To illustrate the problem that I have, let's look at a general fight that you can have on the Great Plateau compared to something you have at the end of the game, and keep in mind that this is pretty surface level to avoid repetition. In some camps, you'll need to keep moving to avoid being hit by arrows. You'll also need to be careful when sneaking in hits since you can easily be killed. You also can't wail on enemies due to your weapons breaking, which encourages you to bring your surroundings into combat. Since you're so weak and have relatively poor weapons, it makes every victory all the sweeter. Once you get off the plateau, you're still weak, so you need to plan out every combat scenario. 
If it's nighttime, stealth kills become a lot easier. However, even with powerful weapons, it still isn't guaranteed that the enemy will die from the sneak strike, so you always need to be careful. If you're quick enough, you can rob the enemies of their weapons, which makes killing them a bit easier. Also, real quick, I love the animation that plays whenever you take their weapons and never cease to get a quick smile out of me. All this is without even bringing up elemental attacks. On the path to Zora's domain, there are the Zolfos that, while weak, have electric weapons that pack a lot of damage. This challenge makes every combat counter fun and engaging throughout the early game. It also makes getting good at combat satisfying and rewarding. That's a lot of positivity that I just showed in your face, so what's the problem? To answer this, I'll ask another question. What's the difference between a red Bokoblin and a silver Bokoblin? The silver one has more health. That's it. It isn't more aggressive, doesn't have different attacks, it's the exact same as a regular one, except now it's a damage sponge. If you take the weapon away, there are no differences, so saying that they have stronger weapons is a poor argument. At the end of the game, you can kind of just throw yourself at enemies with no consequences. You'll have really good weapons and a huge stock of arrows and food to instantly heal you, completely nullifying all challenge that the game once had. Instead of having to conserve resources, you can just barrel through all of them with no consequences. This brings us to cooking. It's a double-sided coin, one side positive and the other side negative. First, the positives. It is a really cool system, being able to find all sorts of different materials and slapping them together in a cooking pot to see what happens is really neat. It's also really tactile with you having to physically hold the items, go up to the cooking pot and drop it in. There's no sub menu so it doesn't feel like you're exchanging ingredients. You are legitimately cooking. I remember on my first playthrough I was trying to figure out how to beat the cold to get to the Cryona Shrine. I found some peppers near the entrance of the mountain and the text that came up when I collected them said that they had the power to reduce the cold. So I ate a couple and attempted to make my way there but it wasn't working. I was still taking damage and I didn't want to waste all my food to brew forced my way to the shrine. Eventually, I discovered the old man's hut, and there I discovered the cooking pot. When I did find the pod and read his diary to learn how to cook, I spent the next five minutes trying to figure out how exactly to get the ingredients out. What ended up happening was I accidentally pressed a button on the controller to make myself hold it, since reading these instructions down here is for the weak of mind. When I left the menu to confirm that I was indeed holding them, I realized that I was now able to cook them. Once they were cooked, it finally lowered my cold resistance, allowing me to get to the shrine. This is the joy of cooking in this game explained with a story, and I hope you're ready for more stories throughout the video, since it's usually the most optimal way of explaining something. I personally found it impossible to make this video without these dumb stories, so I apologize in advance. Anyway, cooking has a lot of different properties that you can exploit, like anything in the wild that you find beginning with hearty makes meals that temporarily increase your heart count. Similar things happen with sneaky or speedy. Combining a hot-footed frog with monster parts will give you a speed boost elixir, which can be really helpful when out exploring. Some food combinations will result in dubious food, which is probably my favorite meal in the game solely because it's pixelated and presented as one of the most vile things in existence. However, the problem with cooking is that towards the end of the game it gets pretty overpowered. There are no consequences to eating in the middle of battle, and it's also far too easy to make meals that auto heal you. Five hearty durians and you've got 20 extra hearts to play with. And not only that, there's a spot right next to the Farron Tower that has a ton of them, so it's always easy to replenish your supply. A simple fix to these two main problems are as follows. Firstly, make it so you need to combine dishes to strengthen effects instead of just being able to get overpowered stuff instantly. For example, combining two hearty durian dishes with a couple more hearty durians gives you more recovery hearts. The second fix is to make eating happen in real time. If this were the case, then you need to always be aware of your surroundings in order to make sure that now would be a good time to heal, instead of pausing the game a split second before you take damage, eat a thing, and then on pause like it's no big deal. Simply making the materials section and the food section on pause time would do a lot in making eating more strategic without having to really change any game elements. It would also mean that even though you have a bunch of overpowered meals, you need to make sure that you're in a safe spot to actually eat them. I'm fine with the game becoming easier by the end after starting out hard, but they took it a step too far here. Whilst we're semi on topic about the combat and stuff, let's discuss one of the most controversial elements of the game, weapon durability. This is by far the least least compelling criticism of Breath of the Wild if you ask me. That's right, I'm on the defender side of the argument. I could give you a list of reasons that it isn't a big deal, but to keep this video as short as humanly possible, I'll just explain it like this. I saw this message far more than this one. 
The game throws so many weapons at you that even after getting your storage upgraded by Hestu, I still didn't have room for all the cool weapons I found. The weapons breaking also forces you to engage with all weapon types at some point in the game as well as trying to find creative ways around certain combat scenarios. I feel like this is the biggest problem that I have with people criticizing this element of the game, is that it acts as if the game isn't built around the system. You are constantly showered in elemental swords and ancient weapons and shields, and they break quickly, sure, but you are always supplied with better and better weapons, so it's best if you just use your good stuff, since there's always a chance it gets replenished. I see a lot of people bringing up repairing weapons, which is really Dumb. It's like Skyward Sword system, but much worse. What's to stop you from going straight to a blacksmith the second this text appears on screen? Sure, they would probably require materials and rupees, and if we're basing this hypothetical system to work like the champion weapons, then I guess that material-wise it wouldn't be too bad. But the only use that a lot of the materials in the game have are to get rupees, so it'd be easy to log around a bunch in case of an emergency. At that point, why even have weapons break at all? It's so easy to come across gems and ores and you can easily get rupees so it really wouldn't be that bad to repair a weapon. It truly would be a stupid system to implement in a game that is built around weapons breaking and constantly giving you more than you know what to do with. I know I just repeated myself a few times here, but that's just how frustrating this argument is to me. I guess one thing that kind of goes hand in hand with weapon durability is the upgrade system. Look, I didn't really have any other place to put this with a natural segue to it, okay? Across the world, you can find great fairy fountains, and since there's no magic meter and you can heal yourself at any time by eating, the great fairies have been given a different purpose by upgrading your armor. First, you need to give them a certain amount of rupees in order to free them. After that, by getting them monster parts, or whatever they ask for really, you'll be able to make your armor better. One fairy can only upgrade equipment a single time, however, so you'll need to visit all the fairies throughout the world in order to fully upgrade yourself. I really like this system since it gives use to everything that you find throughout the world, which makes it so that no matter what, it never feels like you're wasting your time when collecting materials. One final thing to mention at this point in the video is the story. Of all the criticisms leveled against the game, the story is by far the biggest criticism that I have seen for it. And the way that everyone talks about it, you would assume that there isn't even a story in the game. Once again, I'm gonna be a contrarian, because Breath of the Wild has a really great story, if you ask me. When you really think about the story itself, you realize that it's actually really depressing. Not quite as sad as Majora's Mask, but no Zelda game will ever match it. The basics are that everyone was horrifically slaughtered 100 years ago during an event known as the Great Calamity because the heroes failed to stop it. This leads into one of the biggest focuses of the story, Zelda. I've seen a lot of complaints that she's whiny, and my rebuttal is that she's a teenager under a lot of stress, and once you realize that, it makes her far less annoying. I think that it makes her more relatable overall. The cutscenes do a pretty good job at showing you what kind of person she is, making her the most fleshed out character in the game. We know her desires and struggles, and assuming you save this memory for last, it also makes it pretty emotional. Zelda isn't the only character in the game though, there are also the champions, so let's get them out of the way. The champions don't really get anything more than a superficial glance, all things considered, which is a little disappointing considering that all of them are skilled warriors, tasked with piloting giant robotic animals, but whatever. I don't really mind that they aren't characterized that much, since throughout the game, they are more often than not portrayed more so as symbols. While we're on topic, I might as well talk about Link. Every time somebody says Link has no personality, a kitten dies. But, but not because I killed them, that's fricked up. I think that when you say Link needs to speak in order to have a personality, it's pretty dumb and ableist. He does give facial expressions, he isn't a block of wood like in the N64 days. Not only that, but the dialogue boxes. When talking to the seal lady, having literally every option be a seal pun doesn't mean anything. When talking to the old man, these choices clearly mean nothing. I hope you understand what I mean. You don't need to have a voice to have a personality. Link is a goofball in this game. He's serious when the time calls for it. For the most part, he's pretty chill and snarky. Now, he's not as expressive as in the Wind Waker or Skyward Sword, but I personally really like this incarnation of the character, specifically because of these options you have to pick from during dialogue sections. If I may nitpick just for a second though, I hate the reason that he doesn't speak in the past is because he's silently bearing every burden or whatever. It's super lame. Why couldn't it have just been that he's a more reserved person who doesn't like to speak? Does there really need to be some grand reasoning behind it? 
Also in Japanese, all of the adventure logs are written in first person, which is another opportunity to flesh him out as a character. But whatever, I guess we're stuck with third person forever, Nintendo of America. One of the biggest ways that the game tells a story is through the world itself. There are ruins everywhere, and it sparks the imagination. Imagination. There are ruins everywhere, and it sparks the imagination to wonder what exactly happened there. For example, there's a village in the middle of some watery ruins. It looks really similar to other ruins that you know are destroyed by the Guardians, but there are none around here. So, based on the environmental clues, you can come to the depressing conclusion that the village was surrounded by Guardians, and everyone was mercilessly killed as the Guardians then went away. The game never tells you this though. You just need to use your imagination like SpongeBob told you to do those many years ago. Another example is this mountain. From the moment you step out of the cave, you can see that there's a giant unnatural hole in it, but the game never actually tells you what happened to make it. Based on the fact that it's in the Hebrew region and the divine beasts shoot giant lasers and a meadow happens to be near it, it can be inferred that it somehow misfired blasting a hole in the mountain. No stupid lore book required. Some of the more interesting things in this game are the Zonai ruins. You don't really learn anything about them, heck, in Japanese, it's literally translated as mystery, but that mystery is why there are several YouTube videos about the subject. It's interesting that they added an entire collapsed mysterious civilization just to make the world feel more real. Every location has its own story to it, you just need to think about what it is. On top of this, throughout the world you can find diaries, the most interesting ones being Zelda's and King Rome Bosphorama's Hyrule's, whose last name I am sad to report is not actually Hyrule. Sad day for us all. These give us a bit more insight into the characters and the world 100 years ago. Like how there was apparently a fortune teller who told them a prophecy about Calamity Ganon's return. Zelda's diary pairs up nicely with the memories, adding a bit of extra context that would have been a bit more difficult to incorporate into those cutscenes. But the main reason that I like this story so much is because at the start of the game, Link wants to defeat Ganon because he's evil. But as you learn more about the world, you slowly get an actual proper reason for wanting to defeat him, which makes the final confrontation that much sweeter. However, all this isn't to say that I don't have any issues with this game's narrative, because now I get into the stuff that I don't like as much. First of all, the voice acting. For a while, it was easy to say that it was the actor's fault. They just didn't get good ones, which, you know, easy to say. However, this complaint is no longer valid due to the existence of Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. The acting in this game is actually not that bad, still not amazing, but the actual performances are more than enough to make it a less cringy experience. So why is it so mediocre in Breath of the Wild? If it's not the actors, then they can only come down to two main problems. Firstly, the timing. For some reason, they didn't reanimate the cutscenes to fit around the actors. So the actors instead had to work with dialogue specifically animated around Japanese. This is already going to make performing well difficult. It also happens to be one of my biggest pet peeves with anything animated in another language localized for English. They never do any proper lip syncing so everything just looks really off and it annoys me that they did it here too. On top of that, the voice direction is complete garbage. Seriously, did they even get a voice director? If they did, he clearly did not do a good job. Directors are important because they can help get a proper tone and performance out of the actors. That's why Rivali is the best in the game. He's a cocky jerk and it's easy to perform since you don't need many pointers to make the character work. There's even evidence in the game that this is the case. I was thinking, this reminds me of the time we first met. You were just a reckless child. Always getting yourself hurt at every turn. What emotion is Mifa supposed to be feeling here? Is she sad? Is she happy to see Link? Is she more somber as she heals his wounds? It's robotic and monotone. There's no emotion felt during the scene where and honestly there should be. Mifa is in love with Link. Why does it not feel that way in her voice? Zelda sounds pretty good outside of the cutscenes when she's just a voice in the distance that you can only hear in your head. There doesn't need to be strong emotion here so she can sound relatively flat without it coming across as jarring and the actress is also not limited by the timing of Lip's movement. This brings me to my main piece of evidence that I have for the directing being the biggest factor for mediocrity. The Japanese voice acting is godly. This scene in the rain is so much more powerful because the actress really gets into the role. It feels like there's a lot more to the scene than just Zelda is sad or moo. It is definitely over dramatic. Funny you think about how at this point in the story everyone she knows and cares about has been left to die and she blames herself. Yeah, I think that it really works. 
it legitimately got me in the feels a bit, unlike the English version where it still works, but it's more dang that sad and less oniony if you understand what I'm talking about. Haha, <laughs> Shrek ref. And that's just the voice acting. Why do the most interesting story beats not happen in the memories? Link nearly dies and we don't see the lead up to it. I don't care that it would have taken several minutes away from the gameplay, it would be really cool to see him fight up until the end, instead of having him already basically be defeated by the time the cutscene starts. The only interesting thing that the story has to offer in the present day is Link freeing the Divine Beasts. There is literally nothing else to it. Did we really need a scene of Zelda putting the Master Sword back into its pedestal? Why couldn't this scene have been Link pulling out the Master Sword for the first time 100 years ago? Why isn't there a single memory of Link being on his own? Why does he have to be with someone? It's clear that they were able to give him personality when talking to NPCs. Why isn't it like this for the cutscenes? These may seem like small issues, when you have games like Wind Waker, which has a really tight story of letting go of the past and making way for the new generation that's honestly kind of perfect for what kind of game that is, or Ocarina of Time with its poignant themes of growing up, or Majora's Mask can have the themes of death, regret, and depression manifest themselves into every aspect of the narrative, or Pride Princess with its epic story with little fluff, it's difficult to not have these things annoy me. All of these games' plots have very little that I can criticize, unlike this one, where I do have issues with it. The highs do put it at a solid number 2 spot in my overall Zelda story ranking, but it could have been the best if they just ironed it out. An idea I've had since launch would be to have the memories actually be playable so that we the player can fight guardians until we're on the verge of defeat, causing the cutscene, or allowing us to ride with Zelda as we get to the statue which transitions into a cutscene, or having us lead Zelda through the forest until she trips, leading into the cutscene. Simple stuff like this would allow the story to more easily immerse the player in the world of 100 years ago since they are living through it along with Link, but alas that isn't the case. And with that, I have thoroughly exhausted my vocabulary when discussing the core of Breath of the Wild. Everything in this section lays the foundations for the game, from the combat to the story, with the visuals and music accompanying the main themes of the game being player choice and discovery. With all that said and done, let's get into what everyone actually remembers this game for. Breath of the Wild's overworld is by far the most expansive and rich overworld in the entire series. Even after five years, it's still kind of difficult focusing on one specific task without getting distracted by something off in the distance. There's no shortage of things to do in the game, but there are three primary things that you keep your eye out for. Firstly, the towers. Since there are only 14 in the game, it means that the game can reasonably expect you to clear all of them. They all have a special challenge involved with each of them. The reward for clearing all the towers in the game is a completed map, making it the only one of the three that feels worthwhile to 100%. The Great Plateau Tower is a tutorial tower, being the only one in the game that you never need to climb. It distills a map of the area for you, which teaches you that if you want to unlock more areas on the map, then you'll have to climb the rest of the towers. Let me tell you, there is no better feeling than getting to the top of a tower and placing the Sheikah Slate into the pedestal at the top. The jingle that plays along with the sweeping camera shots showing you what you just unlocked is such a rewarding feeling, especially on the harder ones. The rest of the towers in the game offer a somewhat interesting trial that you must overcome in order to climb it. Not all of them do that of course, take the Dueling Peaks Tower. This one is in the middle of a river, so I suppose the challenge is getting to the tower, but as long as you use Cryonis, it's really not that big of a deal getting over to it. The Elden Tower is in the same camp, being relatively easy to access and climb. Ateno Tower is a pretty good example of an actual tower that requires strategy to climb. The whole thing is covered in thorns, so you need to chart out an optimal path that lets you climb up to the top. The central tower is surrounded by guardians, so you need to be careful when climbing not to get hit by the lasers. Or you could be a baby and kill them before you climb, but you would never think of doing that, would you? The Woodland Tower has an enemy camp built around it, so you need to navigate around that in order to get to the tower. Of course, these ones have more challenges associated with the process of climbing them. There are a few where the challenge comes from actually getting onto the tower. Take the Heber Tower for instance. There are these blocks of ice that you need to melt in order to begin climbing, but from there the climbing process is fairly straightforward. The Laneru Tower is at the top of a hill, however in order to get to it you need to get through a bunch of enemies located all along the path up it. The Wasteland Tower is surrounded by mud, along with also having fewer platforms on your way up, so you need to think of how you can not only get over to it, 
but how you can climb up it as well. The Ridgeland Tower is surrounded by water and electric enemies, so you need to take care of them before you start climbing, especially the Wizrobes, who can actually follow you on your way up. Farron Tower is relatively simple, with you just having to create an air current to bring you up to a level where you can actually get onto the tower. The Grudo Tower has this long winding path you can take that will eventually lead you to the top, since the tower is so long that you can't really climb it. The Tabantha Tower requires that you find a way to climb around the Malice, or find a way to clear it by shooting the eyeball causing a rock to fall, allowing an easier ascent. Of course, the best tower in the game is Akala Tower. It's a challenging section since the whole place is surrounded by Malice, tough enemies, and a freaking Guardian Skywatcher. You need to explore the area and look around in order to find an optimal path allowing you to reach the top. You aren't required to do any of this to climb them though. You could just find a higher place to jump from for the Farron or Gerudo Tower since there are cliffs surrounding them. And if you're a little baby, then you can use Ravali's Gale to completely bypass every single obstacle they throw your way. No matter what, the game doesn't force you to complete them in a specific way. Once again, player choice is what makes all the towers so enjoyable. The towers also serve as a major goal that the player can keep in the back of their minds as they explore. They make a pin in the distance and as they approach it, who knows what they'll find. Which brings us to the Korok Seeds. If you ask me, I think that most people make dumb arguments when criticizing them. The game doesn't really ever lead you to think that you should collect all 900 in the game. In fact, I would argue that it actively discourages it since your reward for doing it is a JPEG of Hestu's gift. It has no in-game application, it's only there to acknowledge that you did it. This is often a point of criticism of the seed, since if there's no point in collecting 900, then what's the point of collecting any? The thing that is often overlooked is that Koroks are not active collectibles, but rather passive collectibles. Basically, during your travels, you'll see something that doesn't look right, or you'll stumble upon one of these magnesis things, and with some fiddling, you'll discover a Korok. It's important that it isn't something you're supposed to be actively looking for, since it means that no matter where you are, you'll be able to find some. It's unobtrusive and it makes exploration feel like less of a chore than it otherwise would be if you were actively looking for them. There's even a reward that you get for giving some to Hestu, since you can expand your inventory slots, making it feel worthwhile to go out of your way to do it. I do have one more thing to say about the Koroks, but since it has to do with the DLC, I'll save it until then. There is another major goal that encourages exploration, that being the shrines. Shrines are dotted all over the world, and when you hear that there are 120 of them, you'd think that they are relatively easy to find. And at the start they are, however it gets to a point that it becomes more difficult to find them, which means that there's usually more to do than just walking over to one. This makes it really engaging to find. I'll discuss the design of the shrines in the shrine section of the video, so we'll get into that a bit later. There's a bit of an imbalance in shrine locations, however, with the Elden and Heber regions in particular getting the short end of the stick. This means that these regions aren't really that fun or worthwhile to explore in comparison to the other ones. It also sucks since the ones in Hebra are really fun, like this one where you need to find a way to get into this underground cave or roll a snowball down the correct path. But there just isn't much of a reason to go out of your way to do it, since it's much easier and less time consuming to go do other ones. To be honest, if I didn't complete all of the shrines for the video, then I probably wouldn't have done a single shrine in either of these regions outside of the Blue Flame, since Minecart, and the one at Goron City. I also feel like there was a missed opportunity here, since you have corrupted Divine Beasts and Guardians, but you don't have corrupted Towers or Shrines. Even the one in Hyrule Castle is perfectly fine, which is just kind of a disappointment, you know? These two issues, well, the second one is more of a nitpick than anything, but anyway, they aren't enough to make looking for the shrines any less fun. There are a few hidden behind shrine quests though, so we'll talk about those when we get there. Alright, let's get into the real meat and potatoes of this section, what there is to do in the world. I've heard some people say that the Great Plateau is more linear than the rest of the game, which really isn't true. Going to the point marked on your Sheikah Slate on the Plateau is the same as it is during the rest of the game. You can take your time and prepare yourself before you do anything. This section of the game isn't necessarily more linear, it's just more hand-holdy. The entire plateau exists to teach you about the basic mechanics of the game. It's not as short as Kokiri Forest, but having a section that you can freely explore is a fair trade-off for length. Once you step out of the cave, you're given three directions. One teaching you about ragdoll physics, one teaching you about combat, and one leading you to the old man. This old man serves as a sort of micro-tutorial teaching you some of the basics of the game, along with a bit of world building. 
You can learn that cooking can augment certain ingredients, though it's not really a cooking tutorial. You can learn about torches being able to be used as either a tool or a weapon. Along this path, you also learn about combat. No matter where on the plateau you are, you are forced to learn about the game's mechanics, and this more hand-holdy section of the game is here so that it can know you understand those basic mechanics when you're set loose upon Hyrule. You are forced to activate the tower here, where you'll learn that this is the main way that you'll be obtaining map data. There are multiple decayed guardians that spring to life surrounding the bomb shrine, which forces you to learn to be careful around these guardian remains, since you never know when they could start attacking you. If you somehow manage to avoid these common encounters, then you are a god. That's another thing that I love about the Great Plateau. You aren't forced to learn about all of the game's mechanics and inner workings here. You can completely ignore cooking, you don't learn about riding horses until you get off the plateau, you don't even have access to the paraglider, etc. It prevents an overload of information by organically bringing these scenarios up. Three of the four shrines here have some sort of challenge associated with them. Magnesis, being the shrine that the game pushes you towards first, doesn't really have any challenge associated with it. The Bomb Shrine, as I mentioned earlier, has decayed guardians that you need to get around. The Stasis Shrine has a couple of things that make it more difficult. Firstly, needing to get to a specific section. There are only really two ways to get to it, either going through Mount Hylia, which is really cold, or you can chop a tree down to cross a bridge. While you never really need to do this again in the game, what it does illustrate is the sense of logic that the game has. I'll get into that way more in the next section though, so sit tight until then. The main thing that getting to this shrine teaches you about is stamina management as you climb up the cliff face. The Cryona Shrine is by far the most engaging challenge to figure out though. You could be a lazy baby loser by tanking the hits and eating food to heal yourself as you make your way over to it. You could use a torch since its heat raises your core temperature, or you could cook peppers to keep yourself warm without any restrictions that the torch brings up. You can also find the old man at the highest point of the plateau who gives you the warm double. Outside of the shrines, there really isn't that much to do. You can find arrows, get into a variety of combat encounters, find a stone talus, I think that the plateau does a great job at illustrating the use of your environment as a good way to dispose of enemies considering how weak you are, but for the most part, it's nothing more than a mechanic teacher to be honest. After this tutorial, you're given the paraglider and are able to leave the plateau, most likely ending up in the Dueling Peaks region. Obviously, one of the bigger landmarks of the area are the Dueling Peaks. There's an NPC who tells you that it used to be one mountain, but a dragon split it in half so it could travel through that area, according to legend. They didn't need to give some sort of explanation for why it's like that, but they did anyway, which just goes to show how much love and detail went into crafting the world. This section of the map follows some of the same elements of the Great Plateau, just with a more hands-off approach. The shrines along this path are all fairly easy and teach you about some other game mechanics that the plateau couldn't really touch on. There are a couple of settlements here, Kakariko Village and the Dueling Peak Stable, which are likely to be the player's first interactions with what the world is like. The stables even introduce you to the idea of some sword that the hero is supposed to wield, assuming that you never played a Zelda game before and have no idea what the Master Sword is. I love this incarnation of Kakariko Village, it really feels like it's built into the mountainside, which gives it a cozy, sheltered vibe. Just outside of the village, you can find a fairy fountain, requiring your rupees to be set free from their prison. If you haven't scraped up enough to free it, then it gives you something to work towards. These areas are also where you get your first real glimpse on what it's like for the people after the Great Calamity. This brings up another point whenever I think about this game. I always feel like the world is a lot emptier than it actually is. There are a lot of NPCs in this game which shocked me. Most of them are only ever really found in settlements like stables or villages, but there are a lot more in the game than I remember. On top of this, you can find strangers under attack from monsters, traveling merchants, Yiga clan members in disguise, or just some regular travelers. You can also find minigame people in more remote locations. All of this adds up to a world that feels more alive than I gave it credit for in the past. Of course, the name of the game is Breath of the Wild, so obviously the game is going to have a focus on the wild. Throughout the world, you can find a variety of animals. Birds, goats, bears, horses, dogs, wolves, hogs, rhinos, bulls, deer, squirrels, frogs, snails, crabs, and fish. This variety really helps immerse you in the world, and it is very befitting of the name. You can interact with a lot of these creatures, being able to feed a lot of them, cooking frogs or snails into elixirs, or fish and crabs into meals. 
Hogs and rhinos can prick right off. My first death in the game was from a hog, so I have a deep-rooted hatred for them. You can ride deers or bears in the mountains, but cobbles don't actually ride horses, but rather bales, which is something that I never came across until this last playthrough. All of this makes the creatures feel less like set dressing and more like actual living things. The Hateno section is when the world starts to truly expand. After meeting with Impa in Kakariko Village, you make your way to the Hateno region, which is far larger than anything you've likely come across at this point. Hateno Village is the main settlement here, which is a bit different to Kakariko. There's a dye shop where you can dye your clothes with some of the choo-choo jelly that you get, the ancient tech lab where you get the camera rune, as well as upgrading your stasis rune to freeze enemies as well, and a bomb upgrade that does more damage and reloads quicker. In order to unlock the ability to upgrade though, you need to light a furnace outside with blue fire. This is a fairly simple task, you can always see where you need to take the flame next, with the only real tricky part being right here at the beginning section, with you having to cross this river. It's still decently fun, and having to decide whether or not to play the conservative route, lighting every lantern along the path to ensure that you don't run out of fire, at the cost of it taking longer, or ignoring the lanterns and going down the path as fast as possible, with the cost being that if the fire goes out, you'll have to trek all the way back to your last checkpoint to relight the torch. Otherwise, it's really not that interesting to talk about, and it serves as more of a tutorial more than anything anyway. Also in the village is a statue that you can talk to in order to trade your hearts for stamina, or vice versa. It's helpful if you accidentally got a stamina or heart upgrade that you didn't want, or if you want to have a bunch of stamina but need to pull the Master Sword out real quick, etc. The big thing to do in the village is the ability to buy your own house, though as with a lot of things that I mentioned thus far in the video, we'll get into that in a later section. There's a sea that you can explore, however there's really not a lot to find out there. One of the big highlights of the area is Mount Laneru. The biggest thing to discover on the mountains is the Spring of Wisdom. Here you discover a dragon covered in malice. You're given a task to save it. So you follow it around, killing the malice eyes all over its body in order to free it. It can take a bit considering how much it moves around, but eventually you'll free it and get one of its scales. After placing it in the waters, you reveal a shrine. This acts as a tutorial for the other dragons, with each one representing some other attribute, the Spring of Power and the Spring of Courage. These other dragons aren't corrupted like this one, however, but finding out where they are can be a bit tricky. Even if you don't see it though, the music will most certainly let you know that they're close. It has a certain haunting beauty quality to it, it's easily one of my favorite tracks in the series. The mountain is also one of the coldest places in the game, requiring you to have multiple layers of cold resistance. In this region is also Fort Hateno, which you'll learn was the only thing preventing the Guardians from getting to Hateno Village. This is evident by the decayed Guardians strewn all over the place, once again showing that visual world building type of storytelling that I really enjoy. The shrines in this section also stop teaching you about game mechanics and start focusing on actual individual puzzles. No longer are they on the side of the road, you need to actually set out and start actively searching for them, which has a different sort of appeal compared to seeing one out in the distance and making your way over to it. The ones on the mountain are the primary shrines that this applies to. After you start the locked mementos quest, the game starts nudging you towards your first divine beast quest with Varuda, leading you to the Lanera region. Zora's domain is by far the most visually cool settlement in the entire game. Everything is so grand with several staircases and walkways, a pretty big step up from being cave dwellers. There's Poimus Mountain that houses what would likely be the player's first encounter with Lionel. This encounter acts as a semi-stealth section, but instead of instant failure upon being discovered, you have to deal with the most powerful enemy in the game, who hits like a truck and has perfect aim, preventing you from leaving. He is scary, and it makes the entire sequence nerve-wracking, unless you keep failing, deeming it to be more worthwhile to actually kill the Lionel instead of doing the stealth section because you keep failing like a loser, aka me. After you beat Varuda, the game stops nudging you, and you are left to your own devices with no real hint of what you're supposed to do other than locate the other three beasts. As such, the rest of the section will no longer follow a specific structure like it has up to this point. The Lake Tower region is one of the less interesting regions in the game. It does house the Spring of Courage, which requires you to get through a difficult enemy camp full of water and enemies firing shock arrows and using electric weapons against you. The only major settlement here is the Highland Stable, where you can get a hint for one of the photo locations if you're a little baby. There's Lake Hylia, which is most notable as the easiest location to spot for Roche. 
I kind of like how unimportant it is in this game, considering that it was such a major spot in previous entries, most notably with it being where the home of the Zoras was located, whereas in this game, it's just a location with no real significance. It really drives home how much it's trying to be something new and different from the rest of the games. There's an archery camp as a side quest that we'll get into in a couple of sections. You can find a giant horse in the Teobob Grasslands, which is a pretty sweet reward. I mean, who doesn't want a giant horse that has infinite stamina? You can also find someone who's holding onto a Shiga orb and they're... Yeah, that. Uh, her name is even Loon, which isn't exactly subtle, but it works. You can even find Mel Melania, the horse god here. If you give him some Endura Carrots, then he will revive any horse that may have died, which is pretty cool. The Farron region has the only optional village in the entire game, or at least the only optional village that existed before you set out on your adventure. Lorland Village has no story relevance, no side quest relevance, none of that. It is simply just a beachside village, far away from everything else. I love the aesthetic design here, it reminds me a bit of Outset Island, actually. I kind of wish this wasn't the only village in the game that had nothing to do with the main quest, but the fact that it does exist at all isn't too bad. You can find Eventide Island in the bottom right hand corner of the map, though yet again, we'll get into that in a later section. There is a forest that you can explore, which is kind of cool I guess, it's definitely one of the more underwhelming sections of the map, and it makes sense that I don't spend too much time here on most playthroughs. The woodlands main feature is the Lost Woods, and this is one of my favorite Lost Woods puzzles in the entire entire series. Instead of having to follow a monkey, a skull kid, or pay attention to the volume of the music, it's all based around following the torch embers that the air blows. The game does kind of teach you this fact, you need to run over from torch to torch, but eventually you get to the last one and you need to use a regular torch the rest of the way. If you didn't notice that every time you go to a torch that the embers are pointing to the next one, then this puzzle will become extremely difficult. But it can be done and it is the most satisfying one in the game to overcome. Of course, subsequent playthroughs are all pathetically easy once you know what to do, but that really isn't a big problem since it doesn't really take away of how creative this solution is. From here, you make it to Korok Forest, which is where the Master Sword is located. Quick side note, this is by far the most satisfying game to get the Master Sword in. Since you can get here at any point in the game, it means that if you're unable to pull it, every time you get another heart container, you rush back here to give it another go. And when you finally get those last remaining hearts and pull it out, the music swells and it just feels so good! You can also find the Forgotten Temple filled with guardians, so you either kill them or attempt to get through it without getting fried. It's pretty fun. I also love the idea of this ancient temple with a giant Hylia statue that gets no in-game explanation. But the only thing that you really get to know is that it's, well, forgotten. Outside of this, there really isn't that much to do in the woodlands. The Ridgeland region is by far one of the least interesting regions of the game. You can find the descendant of Zelda's horse here, and that's about it. Shrines are relatively easy to find here, so exploration is a little lackluster in comparison with the rest of the regions. Uh, what else is there to say here? It's kind of a low point on the map. Oh wait, it's Satori Mountain! This location is basically a tribute to Satoru Iwata. It's really peaceful with only style enemies residing here. There's a few lone trees, a rock that has a diamond underneath it, which is pretty funny. It's also the closest spot in the game to matching the cover art, which I just personally find interesting. Other than that though, it's a pretty lame region. The Tapantha region has some of the same issues as the Ridgeland, however there are some more interesting locations here. Rito Village is my favorite town in the game, it is so cozy, the music is phenomenal, and the general environment is just perfect. I love how the entire village is built around a giant rock being extended from it. It can be a little confusing to navigate, but that's a small price to pay for salvation. The fly range doesn't really have anything to do outside of the main quest, but it does exist, so that's pretty cool, I guess. There's Warbler's Nest, which has the shrine quest to do. There's a foot race minigame. Well, once again, there's really not much to say about the region. The Hebrew region follows this same pattern, which just goes to show that the western portion of the map really doesn't get the same amount of care and attention that the rest of the map does. The majority of the shrines in this section are hidden, which on the one hand is pretty fun trying to locate them, but on the other hand, it does make exploration feel less fulfilling. There's nothing interesting to see, so it makes this region really boring. The Gerudo region is more of the same, nothing to really say, it's just kind of b boring. Basically, discount Hebra, with the same issues and everything. The Wasteland region actually does have some content, shockingly enough. 
Though the desert section is relatively empty, however, there's something that makes up for that, but we'll get into that in the next section. There's a giant skeleton that you can find with the Great Fairy located here. There's Car Car Bazaar, which is kind of like a stable, at least in terms of what it has to offer the player. There are a few different side quests you can start here, as well as being the only way to get into Gerudo Town. I don't like how you have to go to Gerudo Town just to get back to the Bazaar in order to get the Gerudo outfit. It's oddly weird considering how little the game forces you into a specific scenario 99% of the time. Gerudo Town is just kind of another village, my least favorite in the game by far. I'm not really the biggest fan of desert themes, and this is just a generic desert village as far as I'm concerned. However, the most substantial piece of content that this section has to offer is the Yiga Clan hideout, which I'll get to in the Divine Beast section since it's involved with that quest. The Akala region is the only place where it properly feels like a different season, with that season being autumn. The big highlight here is, of course, Terrytown, but that's a side quest, so we'll get into that later. You can find the Akala Ancient Tech Lab, which is the second most interesting thing to find there. You can buy a bunch of overpowered ancient weapons and armor, though they're really expensive to balance it out. Not only that, but it also costs ancient parts, really the only use that they get. Much like the other tech lab, in order to have the ability to buy these things, you need to light the furnace outside. This blue flame quest is so much more difficult than the previous one. It's a lot more confusing than the previous quest in comparison to Hateno's too. The way that they're spaced along the path that you can take meant that I was a lot more engaged here. There's a level of mapping that you have to do if you really suck at video games, such as me. Another thing that makes this section a lot of fun is that there are enemies that you need to worry about. You could either kill them along your way to the lab, or you could attempt to avoid them, which yet again makes the entire sequence really enjoyable. You find the Spring of Power here, Skull Lake, which is where you meet Kilton, who sells you a bunch of cool outfits and other monster-related items in exchange for Mon. It's currency that you get from exchanging monster parts. There's this cool spiral beach, and oh my gosh, it's the zone I... <laughs> Sir, sure, let's go with that one. The Elden region is pretty depressing since, yet again, what is there to do here? Exploration in this region isn't just unfulfilling, it straight up doesn't feel fun. Or at least Hebra had enjoyable exploration. It's just kind of a... Boring region. Outside of the main quest, it really doesn't have anything noteworthy. There's Goron City, which has this pretty cool caveman vibe to it. Everything is primitive here, the music accentuating that. It really sells the Gorons as these dim yet lovable creatures, easily the most wholesome in all of Hyrule. Though it is one of the weaker settlements in the game, I just wish it was more interesting to explore around it like with the other settlements, but you can't win them all. Finally, there's the central region. The main shtick with this section is that there are guardians everywhere. It's the most dangerous section of the map in the early game. Whenever you're there, there's this feeling of dread since the enemies here are far more powerful than you. They have greater range and can basically just slaughter you where you stand. Which is what makes going there once you become an overpowered warrior so satisfying. You can easily kill all the enemies who seemed intimidating before. Guardians are no longer a threat. And no, not just because you can glitch them through the floor like a coward. Once you can comfortably roam this section of the map, you know that you've truly conquered the game. Of course, there's one slight disappointment that I have with the central region of the map, the shrines. They are all test of strength shrines. Now, two of them are right by stables, which are actual puzzle shrines, and there is one puzzle shrine a bit further out from Hyrule Castle than the rest, uh, but seriously, three out of the nine shrines is not exactly a preferred ratio. Now, you might think that I've given the overworld a bad rap here, but the thing is, a lot of these issues that I have with certain sections are alleviated by the fact that everything is interconnected as a large world that you can zip around very easily. Who cares if some areas are less interesting than the others when on the whole you can go wherever, whenever. Of course, there are two other main things to do in the world. Firstly, the minigames. Throughout the world, you can find some classic Zelda-style minigames. There were a lot more out in the actual world than I remember. In fact, there were so many games and locations that I had never even discovered until this most recent playthrough. These are probably my favorite minigames in the entire series. I love how the majority tie into the world itself and aren't confined to some specific space. It really adds to the richness of the world. Of course, there are a couple that don't, which is obviously fine, but the fact that even the mini games have elements of overworld design is really cool to me. On top of the Ridgeland Tower, you can do the Birdman Research minigame, and apart from having a bopping tune, it's just pretty fun. Attempting to get as far as possible using whatever means necessary is 
pretty fun. It's also pretty challenging with you being basically required to consume sand or restoring foods and also starting many, many forest fires. Overall, a solid minigame that tests your endurance skills. Boom Bam Golf is a minigame that you can play just south of the Tabantha Tower. As the name would imply, it's golf, just that instead of using a golf club to hit a small ball, you're using a sledgehammer to launch a rock shaped like a golf ball towards the hole. It's a pretty fun minigame, having to figure out how hard to hit it and to get in the hole in as few strokes as possible, with multiple playthroughs being required to really master the game. Or you could be a cheating loser and bring a minecart over here and use it to bring the ball over to the hole and shoot it with an arrow so it counts as a hole in one. I actually don't even know if it's possible to legitimately get a hole in one, but whatever. I do think that the course overall is a little too generous. If you get the hole in 20 or less strokes, then you'll get your money back. And unless you really suck at it, then you're unlikely to make a loss. There's a mini game and a call up based off the blue flame quest. Your goal is to get from the main furnace up at the tech lab and bring it down to the stables by Aya. It's a pretty fun challenge, especially if you figure out that you can light different lanterns nearby before engaging in the quest, so then it becomes a game of finding the optimal routing. And not much else to say. You can evade the vegan lifestyle properly by going deer hunting in Taino Village. There's not a lot to this one, you just go around killing deer with the only extrinsic reward that you get out of it being rupees and some meat. However, it's pretty fun trying to get a high score. The foot racing minigame is like Koopa the Quick, but Zelda edition. In a good way, of course. It isn't just some lame race, there's some rocks rolling down the hill at you, electric choo-choos, an explosive barrel that blows up a tree as you pass it, and you need to worry about all of these things since you'll basically fail immediately if you get stopped by them. It isn't challenging in the slightest, but it is pretty fun, assuming you're not a coward who ignores the path and just runs straight towards the flags. In Luralin Village, you can do some gambling, which is kind of like the gambling minigame in Ocarina of Time, but you don't have the lens of truth to cheese it. I'm not really the biggest fan of this one, honestly. It's all luck based, so if you choose wrong, well then too bad. With no strategy, it just becomes, well, gambling. Besides, it's so easy to make rupees in the game anyway just by selling a bunch of the ore that you find that I really don't see the point in participating in this. The Archery Courts is your standard target shooting mini game that's become a staple of the series. It's pretty fun, with a big reason for that being the improved control of the horses in this game. Since you're moving and not on rails for the duration of the mini game, it makes for a really enjoyable time. If you break all 25 of the targets, you can get some new gear for your horse, which is a pretty good reward, even if it only is a cosmetic change. You can also perform the infinite glunch glunch? You can also perform the infinite jump glitch using this minigame, so for all these reasons, it's my favorite minigame in the game. Keeping to the theme of horses for the next one, at the Highland Stable you can do a quick obstacle course. It's decently fun and has a decently good reward, I suppose. Though the lack of anything to do beyond just jumping over fences hinders this one and doesn't really aid in its replayability. You do get some harsh armor for completing it at a good time, so there's that I suppose. In the Hebra region around Selmy Spa you can do a really fun shield surfing minigame. It's as simple as getting down to the end of the path as swiftly as possible, and trying to accomplish this task is really fun and rewarding. There's even an advanced course that's more fun to go down at the cost of being more difficult. It even incorporates the use of the paraglider, which was a pretty fun surprise to learn. Regardless of any extrinsic value that you could get out of this course, the intrinsic value is through the roof. Also located here is a bowling minigame. There's not much to it, but it's pretty fun lining it up to get a strike and oh my gosh. Yeah, it's a pretty good rupee farming spot if you're good enough at the game. And it's honestly not too difficult to master, so it's relatively easy to become a thousandaire just by doing this for a couple of hours or listening to some YouTube videos in the background or a podcast or something. Now for the minigame I only just discovered during this playthrough, the paragliding course on Eventide Island. For some reason, I never thought of going back here after the trial, but if you do decide to come back, then you'll be greeted with a Wind Waker-esque gliding minigame. There are a couple of paths that you can take, and the main goal is to get through as many rings as possible. It's a legitimate challenge, and man is it fun. There's a stamina management that you need to worry about, as well as a variety of different ways to try and get through the rings. You'll need to go around enemy cams, buy a sleeping Hinox, as well as this stump in the mud that always sticks out in my mind for some reason. I like how the whole minigame is kind of like a tour of the whole island. It also doesn't hurt that you get a bunch of rupees out of the whole ordeal. The last two minigames are actually a part of Shrine Quests, meaning they're the most likely to be played by most players. 
Now, the setup is basically the same. There's an easily accessible ball that you're not allowed to touch because people will get mad at you and say that you need to earn it. The easier of the two is by far the Sandsteel Race. The course is pretty fun and trying to get through it as efficiently as possible can be quite enjoyable, though I really don't see the need to ever do it again after unlocking the shrine, though you can if you want to. Finally, there's the Gut Check Challenge, which is a pretty interesting minigame since it not only involves you having to climb, but also collecting rupees as you climb. So the challenge comes from not only needing to get to the top in time, but also needing to get enough rupees to pass, so you need to prioritize whether or not it's worth it to go out of your way to get a higher value rupee at the cost of time. Outside of that, there's not much else to say, it's just a fun mini game. Before we move on to the next section, there's one more thing to talk about, that being the memories. The memories are the primary way that you learn about what happened 100 years ago. I already mentioned what I do and don't like about the story in the previous section, however I'm here to talk about how the memories serve the gameplay, because man is it fun. To be honest, it might just be the highlight of the entire game for me. There are a total of 12 photos, with the 13th one being unlocked after you find them all. I will say that some of the pictures don't really make sense, like this one for example, Link and Zelda are running through the forest, covered in mud. Zelda laments that everyone in the kingdom is either dead or as good as dead, and how it's all her fault, crying as Link comforts her. And then she gets up and takes a picture of the trees. It's also just a super random picture to take. Uh, that put aside, trying to find these photos is a super fun challenge. Uh, some are pretty easy, like the one at Karakara Bazaar that's in plain sight, or this one that can be found fairly easily by using the Dueling Peaks as a reference. Then you have some that are a bit more difficult to locate, but can be found if you analyze the photo enough, such as the one at Elden Canyon, Urch Plain, the Spring of Power, Sanadin Park, Ruins, or the Lanero Road East Gate. And this one is just straight up by a shrine, so it's kind of hard to miss it. But then you have a couple of truly devious ones that really require scrutinizing over specific map details. This one located in West Nakuda has a few landmarks that can be cross-referenced with details on the map fairly easily. However, the last one doesn't have that. The only real information that you have is that it's in a forest and it's along a path. You could probably deduce that it's somewhere in between Hyrule Castle and the Nehru Gate based off of the previous memory, but that only helps so much. It's the one reason that really shows why I love memory hunting so much. It encourages you to really explore to find them using what little visual clues there are to find these spots. And whenever you see that glowing spot and press A to recall, it's such a satisfying moment. Of course, there's one major memory that I have yet to mention. I remember I was horrified at the thought that I have to go to the depths of Hyrule Castle in order to get this memory. It's such a scary location and walking in was definitely about what I expected. Having to slink up to one of the towers without being blown to smithereens, hoping that you're heading to the correct tower, is a similar yet more potent form of adrenaline that you would find in other stealth sections of the game. Also this can happen to you if you aren't careful, what a cheap shot. Overall, the world of Hyrule is successful since it manages to have a large open space with plenty of interesting things to uncover, a series of really fun minigames, shrines to uncover, towers to clear, and Koroks that make exploration even more engaging. However, there's more to the game than just the world, and people really sell the game short when they judge it by that metric only. So let's get into other reasons that the game is so great, because there is more to my love for Breath of the Wild than just a fun overworld exploration experience. Breath of the Wild's world carries far too much power when it comes to the enjoyment that the game has for some people. While it is true that the most enjoyable aspect of the first playthrough comes from exploring the world, I've replayed the game 9 times since that first playthrough, so clearly there's something else that keeps me coming back to this game. Exploration really can be the only thing the game is built around, since that's not enough of a hook. This game's hook, and the reason that it was delayed several times, is due to the physics engine. This game is built around realistic interactions which serve to immerse the player and to get them to always be thinking of what they could do. It allows the devs to introduce organic, non-linear puzzle design, not only in the shrines but in the overworld itself. A big focus of the game's first proper trailer wasn't the world, it was how you interacted with that world, which is why I would consider it to be the most important aspects of the game. 
There are just a lot of cool interactions that one can experience just by thinking logically. You can burn or break wooden chests as if you were to break a wooden crate which drops the contents inside. You can use melons to hold down switches or you can just use stasis to hold down switches, meaning you don't have to find an object to hold it down. In Death Mountain, all normal arrows become fire arrows, which also means that if you're trying to use bomb arrows here, it'll blow up immediately. You can boil eggs just by visiting a hot spring, visiting cold regions freezes food, and visiting hot regions cooks it. Beating your horse in Dura Carrots will increase the amount of spurs that it can do, which can be inferred due to its effect on you when cooked. Ice arrows instantly kill all fire enemies, and fire arrows instantly kill all ice enemies. Shock arrows can affect a large group of enemies in the same body of water, allowing for more strategy. If you can think of something that would probably work in real life, then there's a good chance that it'll work in the game, and that attention to detail is so impressive even five years later. There are even smaller visual details like getting sunburned in the desert or Link's face whenever you don't have a weapon you can use. Of course, there are also a bunch of other smaller things in this game on top of this logic. If an Octorok eats a rusty sword, it will spit out a non-rusty one. I have no idea how the heck people discovered this, and there's nothing in the game that would indicate that there's any benefit to throwing it at one, but the fact that you even can do it is just insane to me. Or maybe I'm just an idiot and this was a well-known thing that nobody told me about. Uh, moblins will throw nearby bokoblins at you in a similar fashion to how bokoblins will throw rocks at you when unarmed. Guardians and stone taluses will fight each other. Who was going around luring a guardian to a stone talus only to discover that this happened when the two met? It is absolutely hysterical though, at least to me. I'm sure that there are plenty of other mechanics that the game has, however, I feel like I've gotten the point across. One of the biggest departures from the rest of the series is the lack of traditional items. I agree with the developers when it comes to the hookshot, having it completely negate the climbing mechanic is a pretty good reason to axe it, but the rest of the traditional items are here in some fashion, even if not as a proper item. There are a few complaints that I've noticed arose because of this, like I have legitimately say people say that they miss how bombs worked in previous games. The thing is, those games were built around a limited supply of bombs, forcing you to think about whether or not this would be a good time to use them. In this game, it would be super demoralizing to come across a pile of rocks, only to realize that you had no bombs, having to either get some or completely ignore the cool treasure, which would break the game's immersive gameplay loop that it has. If you can't access all the secrets in Hyrule at any time, then what's the point of exploration? Boomerangs work better as weapons in this type of game, since arrows are generally pretty good at fulfilling roles that boomerangs had in previous games. Breath of the Wild doesn't rely on these older items, instead making your arsenal consist of tools that allow you to explore the world, uncover its secrets, and have them all interactable with the world at large. These runes all serve a specific purpose, and all of them get a significant amount of use throughout the game. Cryonis is the least utilized when it comes to puzzle solving, however it's really effective if you want to cross a river or a large body of water without swimming or if there isn't a nearby raft. Sure, it takes longer, but it conserves stamina and makes it so that you are never limited in how you get around water obstacles. You are limited to three pillars, which is where the puzzle element comes in, since most of the time, the puzzle is where to place the three pillars to solve it. These puzzles are never usually too interesting, with only one really stumping me, though since it was added in the DLC, we won't get to it for a while. That's not to say that it's the least compelling of the runes, however, as that honor goes to the camera rune. It's by far the most useless rune in terms of use to the player when judging as if it had the same purpose as the other runes. You can take selfies with it, however, the two main uses it has are firstly, to help enhance the Sika sensor so you can locate things other than shrines with it, and the Hyrule Compendium. This compendium is really fun to complete, trying to get a picture of every creature in Hyrule is a really fun task, though you don't really get a reward out of it, it's pretty much just there for the sake of your own personal enjoyment. And since it's so easy to ignore, there's really no harm to it. You've got two bombs, one round, the other square. They're bombs, so I won't waste too much time, uh, but basically you can place one and it goes boom. Square ones are more optimal if you need to keep it from moving around too much, whereas the spherical ones are optimal for sending them to some location, or if the bomb's position isn't that important. Not much else to it, they make big explosions and stuff. It's with the last two runes that things become really interesting. Stasis has the ability to freeze objects in time, allowing you to either bypass dangerous obstacles, or launch something in some direction by hitting it a few times. It's always interesting since you have a general idea of what will happen, but you don't know exactly how it will react if you're not some kind of speedrunning god. Eventually, you can upgrade it to freeze enemies as well, which makes combat a bit more interesting, though I personally just like to use it to send guardians and castle town through the ground. Cause I'm a coward. 
The fact that you can use stasis on pretty much everything opens up so many possibilities and is a mechanic that's just fun to fiddle around with and see what kind of shenanigans you can get up to. But by far the most useful room in the game is Magnesis. This allows you to manipulate and move metal objects around and while the controls are a little awkward it isn't anything you can't get around. It can be used to find all sorts of metal objects throughout the world, usually chests that give you some kind of reward for finding it. And since you can do a lot more with magnesis than you could with stasis, it's also a lot more fun to mess around with. Especially using a small metal sword to push things regardless of size and waist. You are an actual god when you use this simple glitch. It's also the one rune that really opens up the puzzles and makes them feel like they're in a proper 3D sandbox space. I really like the puzzles that have to do with electricity since they're usually about moving the current and you have a limited number of metal objects to work with. It really is the primary puzzle rune and it gets used in a lot of interesting creative ways. This segues into how the puzzles are designed. Instead of having rigid puzzles with one solution that you need to find, the puzzles in Breath of the Wild are based around the physics engine, as well as giving you what feels like near infinite ways to solve any one puzzle. Fire-based puzzles can be pretty fun to try and solve, or you could just use a fire weapon or fire arrows to solve it instantly. That isn't nearly as satisfying from a puzzle perspective, but it is a pretty rewarding feeling to kind of game the system. Like you found a secret hack that you exploited, except it's completely intentional. Metal weapons can be used to help solve electricity puzzles, giving you more objects to work with, making the overall puzzle a bit easier to solve. There's always a way to solve these kinds of puzzles outside of these short hacks, and they are definitely a lot more satisfying to solve this way, but I still don't feel like there's a sole intended solution. Another thing that this game kind of adapts from Skyward Sword is a blend of overworld and dungeon, though instead of having the dungeons bleeding into the overworld, the overworld bleeds into the dungeons. We'll get into some of the negative consequences of this once we get to the divine beasts and shrines, however now we'll stick to how this positively affects the overworld. The Koroks are the main source of the overworld puzzles that you can find throughout the overworld. These magnesis puzzles require you to make an observation of the entire section, and as we've hopefully established, I'm a complete moron, so I find these puzzles a bit difficult to solve since you need to look around the environment to see where you need to place the metal block. There are some sweet navigational puzzles, like how you'll get through a certain area with your current resources, how you'll approach an enemy camp, how long you'll get around the stupid rain, more on that later. Overall, the puzzles in Breath of the Wild are designed to fit around the theme of player choice, and it succeeds with flying colors. When it comes to the whole idea of interacting with the world, one important thing is movement. How do you traverse the landscape? We'll start with the biggest mechanic, climbing. It is shocking just how ridiculous climbing is in this game. You can go anywhere with only the rain to stop you, we'll get to that in a bit, don't you worry. You're really only limited by your stamina, but even then there's a way to bypass it by eating foods that restore your stamina or even give you extra. When you climb your first mountain and get to the top, you feel so powerful, like there's nothing that the game can throw at you that you can't overcome. This contrasts with the early game where you're really limited in your options. Having tall cliff faces allows the game to have a sense of progression that slots in organically with the rest of the game. It's also one of the main ways that the game handles stamina management since there aren't stamina berries everywhere that make climbing a complete joke. Another way that the game opens the world up to you and one that pairs perfectly with climbing and stamina management is paragliding. The paraglider is by far the most fun mode of transportation, never getting boring. It acts as a reward for when you get to the top of some mountain or tower since you can have a smooth descent, free to go wherever you please. Since you don't have it from the beginning of the game, it shows you just how limited you really are if you don't have access to it. It takes a long time to get down from a high location, meaning either extreme annoyance awaits you or sometimes will just be more beneficial to find an alternate path down. It's especially interesting on repeat playthroughs. It can feel a little annoying not having it at your disposal from the beginning, but the Great Plateau is the only moment of the game where higher areas aren't that alluring, so with every playthrough for that first hour or so, you'll have to think about overworld movement more than usual. Side note, whenever you go too fast, the game will freeze so that it can catch up with you. When I was just gliding normally, this happened. It has nothing to do with anything, I just thought it was interesting. Stamina is also a big element of the paraglider, since the radius of where you can go is pretty small, with every upgrade that you get making the circle that much bigger. The height that you start at is also pretty important. The higher you are, the further you'll be able to reach, but if you don't have enough stamina to make it, you still won't make it very far regardless of how high you are, which is why I personally feel like the paraglider is the one mode of transportation most limited by the lack of stamina. Wind direction is also something that can affect how you traverse through the world. Some shoot you up into the air, while some push you along horizontally across the landscape. 
It isn't utilized that much, however, usually being limited to puzzles related to shrines, and it's one aspect that I hope gets fleshed out in the sequel. What little use it does get is pretty cool though, with the puzzle usually being about how you're supposed to move through the area. If you want to get across a long stretch of land and don't feel like sprinting all the way there, horses are your best option. I absolutely love how you have to catch your own horse. Some of them will be too powerful for you, and you'll either have to consume a bunch of stamina foods, or give up and try again once you obtain more stamina. Every horse has some advantage or disadvantage, like more stamina, with the trade-off being that they're slow, or having less stamina but being faster. Or they could just be a god and have lots of stamina and be fast, or be the worst horse in the game with low stamina and being super slow. Horses are also pretty realistic in that sometimes they'll hate you and veer off the path in their own direction, so you need to sue them in order to put them back on track. That sounds like it would be super annoying, but it's honestly not too bad. It isn't impossible to control or anything, and it's easy enough to fix that you're, all you're left with is another bit of immersion. It feels like a real creature, and not just a line of code. It makes sense that after catching it and registering it, it wouldn't exactly be thrilled with having a new master. One area where I feel like they falter a bit is in the fact that if you get distracted by something off in the distance, which you most likely will considering that this is Breath of the Wild that you're playing, horses aren't really that useful unless you're going across a flat plain. I have never had a good time trying to get my horse across rocky terrain, with them usually getting stuck in some place, forcing me to abandon them for a bit. It's just easier to go across these locations on foot. Horses aren't the only things you can mount, you can ride deers and bears as well. They can't be registered as stables for some reason, which is literal racism, so it feels like riding them around is more of a novelty than anything else. The controls also feel less robust than horses, particularly with the deer, who are really difficult to describe. I guess the best way I can put it would be that you can feel a slight stop with every gallop that they make, if that makes any sense. Bears feel heavy, but they aren't nearly as weird feeling. There's also the Lord of the Mountain, which apart from being the most amazing name for any creature in video game history, is a pretty sweet ride that you, once again, can't register due to racism. He's fast and has good stamina, and controls pretty much the exact same as a horse, but he's also blue when he glows in the dark, which coupled with the legends you hear about him makes finding him one of the coolest discoveries in the game. I wish that the horses and other creatures got more utility in the game, but it's not like they're completely obsolete. So let's say that you're at the top of the hill, and you want to get down with someone who is the peak of humanity, and not a little baby, like someone who uses Revolve's Gale to bypass the towers. Well, that's where Shield Serpent comes in. There's really not that much to talk about regarding it, but what I can say is that it is easily the most satisfying thing in any video game that I've ever played. It is so much fun trying to get down a slope as fast as humanly possible. Unfortunately, Shield Surfing uses a lot of durability, so I never really feel comfortable doing it unless I have a bunch of spare shields, since they're pretty helpful in combat encounters. It's the one area where I have a problem with the durability. They should break way slower than they do if you ask me. Something similar to shield surfing, but isn't quite that, would be mounting a sand seal. Sand seals are a little difficult to control, but they are by far the best mode of transportation in the desert. To control seals properly, you need to avert your focus away from Link and direct it to the seal. This is because Link swings from side to side, which causes you to make a lot of unnecessary adjustments that make controlling the seal a lot more cumbersome than it needs to be. Focusing on the seal itself makes traversal a lot smoother, since Link will never get into a situation where averting attention away from him will get you in trouble. I feel like one of the bigger missed opportunities with this game was with water exploration. This is the only 3D game outside of Wind Waker to have no underwater exploration of any kind. I can definitely understand why, considering how they built the world, however the fact that there isn't at least one area where you get to go underwater is a pretty big missed opportunity. Swimming is pretty slow, even with the full Zora armor. I feel like they could have bumped up the base speed to be that of the Zora armor, and when you have the full armor set, the speed is heavily increased, like how substantial the climbing armor is. There is another way of getting around the water outside of swimming in Cryonis, that being the raft, and oh boy is it fun! It takes a while to build up speed, but once you do, there is no faster way to cross a body of water. It's also really fun trying to maintain your speed, with you getting a quick speed boost that decelerates pretty swiftly if you use a powered up attack on it, and having it take longer to get speed if you use regular attacks. It is a very minor inconvenience that you can only use a raft if you have a Korok leaf, but you can find them pretty easily if you commit enough deforestation, hence the usage of the word minor. Everything in this section has been pretty hunky-dory so far, but it's here that we get to Breath of the Wild's biggest sin. The rain. This is where I come across as extremely over-exaggerated in my loathing, however, considering how much of a contrarian I am to the three biggest complaints people have levied at this game, I feel like I've earned it. 
The rain is the biggest problem that I have with Breath of the Wild. No, it's not a nitpick, it's a legitimate issue. Remember back when I said that the game was about both player choice and discovery? The rain goes against both of those concepts, though the latter is far less offensive than the former. It is impossible to climb in the rain. You can barely climb a surface twice the height of Link if it's raining, since you make about an inch of progress and lose a ton of stamina. There are some areas in the game that rain eternally, and these sections usually aren't that bad since it's specifically designed around the fact that you can't climb. But what if you wanted to climb in an area that's designed to let you climb there? Well, you'll just have to wait around. No, I'm not joking, the developers legitimately didn't see how annoying it was. It can take upwards of minutes before you're allowed to climb again. Another option would be to just camp out, but a lot of the time it's not really an option. It takes away the player's choice to climb. Now this wouldn't be a massive issue if there was some way to overcome the rain later in the game, but there isn't. So you're just left to do nothing for several minutes, waiting for the game to let you have fun again. By limiting where you go, it also impacts discovery. Since half the world is vertical, you are locked out of half of the world. You could go somewhere else, but why would you want to do that when you want to see what cool thing is just over the ridge as soon as possible? It's pretty much the only thing in the game that legitimately ruins any fun that I was having, which is quite the achievement, but not something that I should be proud of. Now I guess that you could bypass the rain by using Revali's Gale, but you shouldn't have to. Also welcome to the slick segue to me talking about the champion's abilities. All of them are pretty overpowered, like it's pretty ridiculous how much of a god you become just by being the divine beast. Since I've already mentioned a couple of times, let's start with Revali's Gale. You get three huge updrafts of wind that you can activate with the press of a button. Not only do you gain a significant amount of height that bypasses a lot of the climbing based challenges, it also makes navigating the world a lot more trivial. It's difficult to not use it in these situations since it's so easy to use, which goes for the rest of the abilities as well. Mifa's Grace is like an overpowered fairy, giving you a full heal along with extra recovery hearts. It does take a while to charge up, which makes it the most balanced of the four, but it's not like that saying much. Daruk's Protection gives you instant protection from any threat, which is great when pairing lasers since it automatically does that for you with you not having to worry about bad timing or your ancient shield taking damage. In regular combat though, you are completely untouchable. It almost feels too overpowered for regular encounters. But then you have Urbosa's Fury, which automatically stuns and damages all enemies within a certain radius. It's also effective against bosses, making it by far the most useful ability in combat. All four of them combined make sure that the game becomes a total cakewalk. It's part of the reason that the difficulty progression is so disappointing for me. It can be fun to completely destroy an entire enemy camp with them being too weak and unprepared to stop your assault, but on the other hand, I feel like they went a little overboard in making the champion abilities feel helpful. Whenever you get to a new area with a climate based challenge, you need to figure out how you're going to overcome that challenge. Once you do overcome it, you're given a set of armor that bypasses the challenge for the rest of the game. You never need to worry about an area being too hot or too fiery or too cold ever again. After you get the appropriate set, you just need to quickly switch into the outfit and you're good. Sometimes it's made up for, like when you get the snow boots or the sand boots since they allow you to traverse the landscape more easily, but it also lowers your resistance. But if you have two pieces of armor that knock your resistance up a bit, then you'll be perfectly fine. It's nothing more than a nitpick, but I do hope it gets smoothed over by making exploration a bit more cumbersome if you do have the full set in the sequel, uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. The final thing to talk about in this section of the video is the amiibo support. I'm heavily mixed on this since you can get some pretty cool things with the amiibo, but I also hide way too many cool things behind it that really infuriates me. Scanning in different Link amiibos allows you to get a Breath of the Wild version of their outfit. That is a perfectly fine, harmless thing. It does nothing being purely for cosmetics. It's also not that big of a deal since you can actually get a proper version of the out specifically for this game. You can get weapons and such from them too, which is fine since they break quickly and are mostly there for the sake of being a cool reference. There are a few helmets based off the Divine Beasts, Valruda and Valmeadow giving you a swim speed up increase by themselves, with Var and Rudania giving you flame resistance and Var Naboris shock resistance. When paired with the ancient set, they act the same as the regular helm. There are two amiibos that give you things that are so good that it angers me, since the only way you will ever be able to experience them is if you give Nintendo extra money for a piece of plastic, or if you scan the NFC code from the internet on one of those special pieces of paper. Skinning in the Super Smash Bros. Link amiibo, you get Epona. Not just a horse that looks like Epona, but the actual Epona. This is the only way that you will ever be able to find her officially in the game. He's not in any secluded area that you could stumble upon or anything. 
But the one that really grinds my gears is the Wolf Link amiibo that gives you a cool wolf companion. People complain about not being able to pet dogs, but imagine if you could tame a dog or wolf in the wild and then make them your fighting companion. That would be so cool, but instead of implementing that cool feature in the game, they logged it behind an amiibo. If you could actually have dogs in the game that have similar functions to Wolf Link, then I would think this is pretty cool. Wolf Link being in the game makes no sense, so why not? That's not even the worst of it though, since he can help scout out shrines and treasure as well. If they were able to incorporate this into the game via an amiibo, then they could have included it in the game without it. I don't own any amiibo, and the fact that I never have and likely never will get to experience a cool mechanic depresses me. Thus continues a streak of really poor amiibo functionality in Zelda games. Outside of the amiibo thing, the ways in which you interact with Hyrule makes exploring everything really fun and interesting with every single playthrough. The little details that the developers included makes the whole game so immersive. Despite the fact that the champion abilities make you a little too overpowered, the rain takes away a lot of the fun of exploring the world for a few minutes and how poor the implementation of amiibo is, I still love coming back to this world and interacting with it in different, interesting ways with every single playthrough. Breath of the Wild has a lot of side quests, and the vast majority share one thing in common. That being, most quests have pretty poor extrinsic value to them. If you're the kind of person who's motivated by cool rewards and stuff like that, then it's easy to say that the quests are all terrible. However, if you're more intrinsically motivated like me, I think that the game has some pretty cool side quests to do. So let's get into them. Also, I'm going to be going through them in no particular order because the organization would take far too long. Robbie's research was already discussed in the overworld section of the video, so there's no point in repeating myself. A parent's love is started in Terrytown and requires you to make a monster cake to heal a sick child. You need to obtain the appropriate ingredients first, and your reward for doing so is 300 rupees, which is a pretty good incentive if you ask me. Hobbies of the Rich is a side quest where you kill a couple of guardians, which is decently fun. Though your reward is kind of annoying. He offers you 100 rupees if you can kill them, but when you come back to him, you only get a red one. I get he's supposed to be a rich jerk kind of guy, but it doesn't mean it's suddenly not annoying. A shady customer is pretty much here just to lead the player to Kilton, or at least that's how I see it. You have to take a picture of him, similar to how Pictobox quests worked in The Wind Waker, with a red exclamation mark in the corner letting you know that the photo will work. You do get a silver rupee out of the ordeal, so it's not like finding Kilton is the only reason to do the quest. Little Sister's Big Request is one of the many quests in the game where you are tasked with giving a certain number of something to someone. In this case, it's three types of bugs, with ten of each type that you can catch in the wild or buy from Beetle. Of course, if you do decide to buy from Beetle, then your net gain will be negative 200 since they cost 10 apiece, and your reward for giving her the bugs is 100 rupees. The statue's bargain is there just so that players don't rage quit after the game after the statue takes away one of their hearts. It signals to them that maybe there's something more to the statue than meets the eye. A gift for my beloved requires you to get 10 restless crickets for this guy so that he can impress a girl he likes. Your reward is a standard 100 rupees, not much else to it. The Weapon Connoisseur is a quest that hurts my soul and is only worth doing for the sake of completion. Basically, you just find a certain weapon and bring it to him. Traveler Sword, Moblin Club, Duplex Blow, Wind Cleaver, those are fine, but he also asks you for a Fire Rod and Frost Spear, which are both really cool, really helpful elemental weapons. Unless you have two, it's annoying when he asks you for them. But the two most egregious ones are the Ancient Weapons. An Ancient Battle Axe Plus, which you can only get from a moderate test of strength shrine. And an Ancient Short Sword, which can only be purchased at a call Ancient Tech Lab for a thousand rupees. Your reward for that one is a diamond, which will only cover half the cost. Why would you ever give this twerp your sick Ancient Sword that costs a ton of money and resources for any other reason than completion? It's frankly disgusting and not even that fun. The Sheep Rustlers involves you having to go down to the Hitano Beach to kill a bunch of monsters in exchange for a bunch of milk. It's a pretty fun, if shallow quest that's worth doing for the combat challenge alone. Sunshroom Sensing acts as a tutorial for the upgraded Sheikah Sensor with you being tasked to find some sunshrooms. Your reward is some hearty truffles. It's a pretty lame quest all things considered, but as I already said, it's more of a tutorial than anything else. Slated for upgrades also barely counts as a quest since it's just there to let the player know that they can upgrade their slate. All you need to do is gather the necessary parts. 
I like that you can upgrade the slate, it's just that making it a quest is a bit much in my opinion. Sunken Treasure is, as the name would suggest, about sunken treasure. You're told about a group of rocks that form a triangle with a treasure allegedly nearby. So you take a raft if you hate inconvenience and arrive there. Here you can find a series of chests with a variety of minerals inside. It's a small thing and it doesn't waste too much of your valuable time, so I enjoy it. What's for dinner just requires you to cook a hearty blue snail with goat butter. Needless to say, it's pretty easy. Take Back the Sea is another quest that requires you to defeat a series of monsters for a reward, and just like sheep rustlers, it's pretty fun, if dull to talk about. Kakariko Village has Coco's Kitchen, Cooking with Coco, Coco Cuisine, and Coco's Specialty. These are half of the quests in the village. They all require you to supply her with some ingredients to get special meals out of it. Pretty epic. Not gonna go in depth with these ones since they're all so similar. To be honest, I think that would've been better if they were all part of one big quest instead of four separate smaller quests. Though I guess they thought 76 sounded better than 72. Playtime with Kala is a decently fun quest with you having to play hide and seek with one of the village kids. Your reward is a rock salt, firmly placing it in the intrinsically rewarding quest. But Firefly's light is locked behind other quests, which is weird considering that all you have to do here is release a bunch of fireflies into someone's house after they ask you to. That's the most notable aspect of the quest. Flown the Coop is a nice homage to Ocarina of Time with you having to find a bunch of cuckoos for a man whose wife left him, since these cuckoos are the only thing that cheer him up. That's awfully depressing. Finding them is pretty fun, especially since some are in more elaborate areas. You really have to explore the village to find them all. Arrows of Burning Heat is yet another scam if you decide to use fire arrows. You need to light the four lanterns surrounding the goddess statue, and your reward is a measly 20 rupees. And if you didn't light your arrows by the campfire nearby, then you will have wasted your money at arrows, which is just a great feeling. The Prize of Maracas is another Defeat All Monsters quest, with this one being different since you're more likely to do this one. If you follow the game's directions and head to Kakariko Village, you'll likely find this weird tree man named Hestu. And of course, you're going to talk to him since he looks wildly different from anyone else you have likely seen up to that point. That's the only thing that's truly worth noting here though. Style Horse Pictured is a quest where you have to get a picture of a style horse, surprisingly enough. It's pretty easy to complete with the only real challenge being actually locating the horse. Curry for what ails you requires you to go to Goron City to bring this chap some Goron Spice. If you've already been to Goron City, then it's really easy quest to complete with the only annoyance coming from the loading times in between travel. Find Keel is a side quest that actually leads into a shrine quest, so we'll get into that later on in this section. Face the Frost Talus tasks you with defeating a Frost Talus, not much else to say about it. The apple of my eye should not be considered a side quest since all you need to do is give someone a baked apple for 100 rupees. Yes, that is the entire quest, I didn't leave anything out. The Spark of Romance has you giving this guy a singular piece of flint for 100 rupees. That's not all though, since if you give him 20 flint, then he gives you 250 rupees, and then 70 rupees for the next 10. Death Mountain Secret starts with some underwater gibberish that you need to decipher, which leads you to the Bridge of Elden. Here you can find a drill shaft, which is a fine reward I guess, but it's not exactly compelling. The Jewel Trade allows you to trade in 10 amber for a greater amount of rupees than you'd be able to sell them for normally. After you complete the quest, you'll either give you rupees for diamonds or topaz, so if you happen to have 10 of them and want some quick cash, then you'll be able to talk to her, but only if you have 10. That means that it's usually only worth going to her on very specific occasions. The Road to Respect has you defeating an Igneo Talus so that this Goron can win his master's favor. It's alright. Fireproof Lizard Roundup has you rounding up fireproof lizards, with the reward being Flamebreaker Armor, which is pretty good considering how easy catching them is. Balloon flight is interesting to say the least. You have to attach two octo balloons to a barrel and send it skyward. It teaches you about a game mechanic and you get a star fragment for your troubles, making it a certified keeper, I guess. Look, like I'm trying to make it at least slightly bearable for you so you can take it or leave it. The Thunder Helm is an interesting quest since it allows you to take and use the helm. This quest actually involves you having to complete all the other quests in Gerudo Town though. This makes it simultaneously a pretty solid, meaty quest as well as a boring, basic, simple quest. The first of these quests that I'll bring up is the Search for Barda, where you need to search for Barda, believe it or not. It's pretty simple considering that she's near the region's Great Fairy Fountain. You also need to give her a hearty durian for some reason, I don't know. I guess it gives some flavor to the quest. Medicinal Molduga involves you having to kill a Molduga to bring its guts to turn them into some medicine. The Mystery Polluter has you locating someone who's poisoned the waterhole. 
Once you find this polluter, she says that she will stop harming the environment if you give her some wild berries. And once you do that, you collect your reward, that being a hydro melon. Luckily, it's part of a longer quest chain, otherwise this would have been unacceptable. The secret club secret is a quest. You just need to eavesdrop on some people to get a password to a secret club, which is where you can buy special armor. I'm not sure why there isn't more to the quest, but whatever. Tools of the trade involves you giving someone 10 flints so they can open the worthless jewelry shop. You do get a free set of jewelry out of it though. After this, you're able to be epic and get the Thunder Helm. However, there are still more quests in this area. The 8th Heroine is a quest where this guy sends you on what he thinks is a wild goose chase to find the missing 8th Heroine statue, only for the statue to actually exist. Also, his name is Bozai, which is pretty close to Bozo. That's pretty epic. It's also the only place in the game where you can get the sand and snow boots. The Forgotten Sword also involves this menace to society, with you being asked to find the 8th Heroine's sword, which is super high up in the mountains. The most interesting thing here is the Lionel that's nearby. Missing in action is a quest where you need to find a bunch of people for someone. It's pretty easy and fun, not much else to it. Rush Room Rush sees your typical give X amount of Y to someone for reward, however this one differs from most since you need 55. It's not like it takes that long to collect that much, but it still takes longer than getting, say, 10 amber or 5 fireflies. To be fair though, your reward is a diamond, and it's also repeatable, meaning that if you somehow got 500 rush rooms, you'd be financially set for the rest of the game. Good Sized Horse is a quest where you sell this guy a horse. That's it. It doesn't really matter what the size of the horse is, you just need to give him one. An Ice Guy just involves you giving Guy a cooling elixir. The most interesting part of this quest is that the name of the quest giver is Guy, since the localization team was lazy, I guess. A freezing rod requires you to show an ice rod or blizzard rod to this here Korok for some money. The Korok Trials quest is completed by doing the shrine quests associated with it, so we'll touch on those a bit later. Riddles of Hyrule is a pretty fun quest, with you having to locate a certain material and give it to Walton. Most of these are pretty easy, I mean, starts with an H and ends with an oof isn't exactly the most subtle clue in the world, but it does help with the Korok's playful, goofy nature, so I ain't complaining. It does mean that you have to kill a Lionel though, so the hint being easy doesn't really help you out that much. Completing it also rewards you with a diamond, which is pretty worthwhile reward if you ask me. Legendary Rabbit Trail requires you to get a picture of a blue pea, which is a creature that gives you rupees if you assault it. I've always had problems with properly framing it, but if there's anything that I've established over these past 5 videos, it's that I am a complete moron, so it's difficult to determine the exact reason I have problems with it. Special Delivery is a pretty fun escort mission, with you having to trail a letter and make sure it doesn't get destroyed by monsters, but you also can't be too far away from it, otherwise it will disappear. It's one of the more fulfilling quests in the game, since it requires more than just getting something for someone. Lionel Safari has you going up to Ploymouth Mountain to get a picture of a Lionel up there. The only thing that's interesting about this quest is the following footage. Also, this clip contains flashing lights, so either look away from the screen or skip forward about 10 seconds in the video. I would hate to give someone a seizure. This is completely unedited footage straight from the console and I have no idea how I even triggered it. The giant of Rallus Pond has you killing a Hinox by Rallus Pond. Frog catching has you catching frogs if you can believe it, and since it's a child who gives you the quest, it means that the reward is quite underwhelming. Zora Stone Monuments has you locating a bunch of ancient Zora monuments. It's really fun just looking around the environment for them, with some of them being hidden pretty dang well. Once again, the reward is a diamond, marking it as one of the highlights in the game. Diving in Beauty is a quest. I guess it teaches the player about diving, but making an entire quest where you just press two buttons is a bit too simple. The reward isn't anything amazing or anything, so it's not like you're just handed the most amazing thing you've ever seen in your life, but it's another one that feels like a way to pad out the quest number so they could have 76 quests as a selling point. Luminous Stone Gathering has you giving 10 luminous stones for two diamonds, which is a pretty good reward for another quest where you just give someone X for Y. A wife washed away has you searching for Azora's wife, who has washed away. Looking for her can be a pretty fun task, more entertaining when you find out that she's happy and oblivious, swimming merrily in Lake Hylia. The Hero's Cache is a quest that always catches me off guard since it's given to you by Cass. I always associate Cass with his shrine quest, but the fact that he has a riddle that has nothing to do with a shrine is pretty cool. It's also probably the most cryptic riddle in the entire game with you having to use military time to solve it, since 17 is 5 o'clock in the evening. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't bring outside knowledge, so it's a pretty mischievous little puzzle. Misko, the Great Bandit, has you follow some clues to find a cave filled with all sorts of goodies. It's very unlikely that you'll stumble across it without a hint, and even with a hint, it's still a little tricky to pinpoint the cave's location. 
The reward is pretty good, and I like how it's like a mini treasure hunt. A Gift of Nightshade has you helping a guy work up the nerve to talk to a girl he likes by giving him some nightshade. It's really easy, but the interaction that happens between the two makes the whole thing really enjoyable. Hunt for the Giant Horse has you locating the Giant Horse. Even though it's large, finding it can still be hard. As mentioned earlier in the video, this is easily the best horse in the game with infinite stamina, making land traversal feel less arduous, making it probably the best reward for any quest in the game. The Horseback Hoodlums has you killing a bunch of bacoblins riding horses. The reward is some Endura Carrots, which isn't exactly the most compelling thing in the world. Thunder Magnet has you removing an axe from the stable to stop thunder strikes, with your reward being the helmet of the rubber armor set. The only thing that makes it a side quest is the reward that you get. A gift for the Great Fairy has you swindling a guy out of 500 rupees. Or you could decide to not be a criminal and legitimately offer to the Great Fairy and free from its prison. Your only reward from the quest is unlocking the Fairy Fountain, so the only course of action really is just stealing from him. Look, if you've already offered something, then it makes it reasonable theft, okay? Leviathan Bones has you searching the map for three sets of Leviathan Bones, hence the name. One is located in the Gerudo region, one in the Elden region, and one in the Hebrew region. While it may be just another quest where you take photos of something and give it to someone, it makes the whole world feel a lot more mysterious and lived in. What exactly were the Leviathans? Well, I hope you're ready to die with that question in your mind, since you never actually learn about their past. It leaves it all up to your imagination, which is what makes it such a memorable quest. The Royal Guard's Gear is a quest where you give someone a royal weapon in exchange for a bunch of rupees. It's a pretty good way of farming rupees if you feel like lugging a bunch around with you, and that's all I know this quest for. Royal Recipe has you cooking some meals for a Hyrule Castle chef descendant. You technically don't need to go into Hyrule Castle to look for the cookbook housing the recipes, uh, but only if you're the most boring person on the planet. After getting the recipe, all you need to do is gather the ingredients and make the dish for the guy. Solid quest. Riverbed Reward is the fourth in the line of quotation mark quests and quotation mark. All you need to do is talk to someone, pull a chest out of the water and open it, then talk to the person again. I really don't know why this was a specific quest and not some random interaction you could have. My Hero, whilst being a really bad quest requiring you to merely have the Master Sword, it does serve a purpose in introducing the idea of some cool sword somewhere in the world to players who may have never played a Zelda game before. A rare find only requires you to sell some raw gourmet meat for some money. That's all I have to say about it. The Royal White Stallion is a quest that is really simple, but it does lead you to the second best horse in the game, Zelda's Horse Descendant. It's a fine quest overall. A gift from the monks is only a quest so that you won't forget about your sick reward or where it's located. You can't tell me otherwise. Hylian Homeowner is a cool quest that only involves you pouring a bunch of rupees into it. I like it since it's not only a good investment to make with your rupees, but also because you get to buy a house. That's just cool. But none of these even hold a candle to what is probably my favorite quest in the entire game, and one of my favorite quests in the entire series, from the ground up. The reason that this quest is so great is because it is the only instance in the entire game that feels like you're rebuilding Hyrule after the Great Calamity. It's also because it's a town that doesn't exist in the game until you, the player, come along. You don't necessarily build it, but you do supply the materials and residence for it. The slow buildup of the music from a humble fixer-upper to becoming a proper town theme is so satisfying. I love how you need to find NPCs that end in sun, as per the Bolson Construction Company compliance thingy. Not only does it make looking for them a lot easier, it's also just really charming. The ending is also really wholesome, with a wedding happening at the town center, which is relatively close to the Akala Citadel, which was the last major settlement to fall during the Great Calamity. It's a sign that Hyrule is truly starting to heal instead of just focusing on overall survival. So why did I spend the last roughly 15 minutes talking about all 76 side quests in the game? Well, it was to illustrate the general strengths and weaknesses. I could have spent a paragraph talking about the reward and a rough process of completion, but I personally feel like it's far more effective to do it this way, since you can really get a good feel for the actual repetition of it all. The quests overall are pretty rewarding intrinsically, but are absolutely horrid extrinsically. Now, we're not done with this section yet, since it is now time to get into the shrine quests. A lot of them are pretty fun, though there are unfortunately a few stinkers. Uh, let's start off with my favorite ones, Cass's Riddles. Throughout the world you can find Cass, and almost all of the quests he offers involve looking around the area that he's in. When explaining how to solve them, they all seem really simple to solve, however with the way that the text is written, it can be pretty tricky trying to solve them. 
Sign of a Shadow has you firing an arrow towards the sun when the Tower of Shadow reaches a certain point. It's completely different from unlocking the arrows in Ocarina of Time since it's more logical given the Piercing Heaven's Light line. Under a Red Moon can also be unreasonably irritating since you need to wait for a Blood Moon in order to access the shrine, so you kind of just have to wait. It's not even a difficult riddle to solve since it's just a rewritten way of saying, wear no clothes and stand on the pedestal. It's easily the worst cast quest in the entire game. The Serpent's Jaw just leads you to the Spring of Courage, nothing interesting to note here. The Crowned Beast is one of the most devious ones, since if you don't know that the Crown of Bone is referring to antlers, it can be difficult figuring out what to do. The Two Rings has you looking around the area to find two holes that you can fire an arrow through, which is a pretty fun challenge. Not only do you need to do that, but you also need to fire the arrow in a way that it can pass through the holes. A Song of Storms, aside from a cool reference to the N64 games, has you finding this mound and having lightning strike it. Master of the Wind, the final one of these quests to mention, is probably my favorite. You need to find and remove a certain set of boulders and unveil a wind current that can take you over the pedestal. There are a lot of different things to bomb, which makes it a pretty interesting ch- I'm not gonna say it again. Overall, Cass's Shrine quests are really fun and interesting. Before we move on to the rest of the game, we need to talk about a certain problem with the Shrine quests. Let's take a look at the Skull's Eye, for example. You can find this shrine out in the open, not only that, but it is incredibly easy to get over to it. Your reward for getting over to it is a blessing shrine. There is no reason that this should be a quest, let alone a blessing shrine. This isn't the only instance of a shrine quest being completely optional either. A landscape of a stable has you locating a shrine based off its location in a stable painting but I found it just sitting out in the open, completely unaware that it was part of a quest. At least this one was an actual shrine. On the one hand, having the quest be optional feeds into the idea of player choice, but on the other hand, it's really annoying that there are specific quests that you can start that really don't need to be there. If some shrines can be hidden behind quests, then why not all of them? Sometimes it makes sense, like with the secret of the snowy peaks where you have to line up the shadow of a snowball with the center of this pedestal. There is no way that you're going to figure this out without some outside assistance, so with ones like that, I'm perfectly content with those ones being actual quests. It's kind of unfortunate that it's not all of them, though. In the Hebra, Gerudo, and Akala regions, you can find these huge mazes that are a lot of fun to try and get through. There are a bunch of different enemies and such throughout, making them some pretty fun challenges. And since you're trying to get to a specific area of the maze and not to the exit, it means that you can't just use the map to cheese it. Of course, you can still cheese them pretty easily if you just memorize the location where you just drop down. Otherwise, it's a pretty fun challenge. Into the Vortex has you taking an orb to the center of this spiral peninsula. There are a variety of ways to get it there, whether you use a raft to carry it across or go through a series of enemies that block your path along the way. It's also the first in a series of quests that you'll see being to take the orb to a pedestal, with them all having some wacky scenario preventing you from just taking the orb straight to the nearby pedestal. A Brother's Rose has you talk to Bladen, who is looking for his younger brother who went off mining in an abandoned mine. Upon arriving there, you find him famished, so you're tasked with getting a rock roast at the bottom of a nearby hill. Getting the roast back up the hill is a pretty fun task, with a series of fire enemies popping up trying to ruin your progress. Once you get back, the roast will be cooked, revealing the shrine. The highlight of this quest is definitely the interactions between the two Gorons. It's pretty great and wholesome. The perfect drink has you going to Gerudo Town to get a drink for someone. The main challenge of this quest comes from getting the ice from the cellar to the edge of these ruins. There are a bunch of enemies as well as the heat from the sun that you need to worry about. It's kind of similar to the Malamark quest from Twilight Princess, except the distance is much smaller. When you do wake her up, she immediately books it to the town, which is simultaneously humorous but also annoying because she could have gone up at any point. Test of Will is a masochist stream come true as you stand on a hot plate with your Goron bros. There's no challenge to it, you literally just stand there for a minute and the shrine reveals itself. The enjoyable interactions make up for the lackluster gameplay though. The Silent Swordsman has you following a series of statues that are pointing in the direction of the shrine. It's pretty easy up until you get to the sandstorm where it can be a little tricky to spot the statues. It also reminded me a lot of Ocarina of Time with you having to cross the desert following a certain landmark. The Seven Heroines has you locating a series of orbs and placing them in the correct pedestal. You have to look all around the area to find these orbs, and then you also need to deduce where to even place them in order to reveal the shrine. It's pretty enjoyable. The Eye of the Sandstorm is a quest that I only discovered during the scripting part of the video, and no I'm not kidding. 
Apparently the shrine only appears during certain times of the day when the sandstorm dies down, so that's kind of cool, I guess. The undefeated champ has you completing the Sansia race I mentioned earlier in the video. Watch out for the flowers as you walking through a simple flower maze since this individual, who has been dubbed by some as Flower Blight Ganon, has a bit of a passion for them. The Three Giant Brothers has you killing three Hinoxes, each of a different difficulty level, in order to open the way to the shrine. A nice combat challenge, but not much else. Secret of the Cedars has you climb a mountain to find some cedars that lead you to a bombable wall hiding a shrine. And not much to say about this one, the only challenge comes from the tree since everything before and after is relatively simple. The cursed statue has a shooting an arrow into the eye of a glowing statue at night, which is a clear nod to Skyward Sword. Also it would be impossible without the obvious hint, and I kinda wish that the game gave you a bit more of a vague hint, but it is a small thing. A fragmented monument has you locating a bunch of monument shards scattered across the beach. It's pretty fun, not much else to say. The stolen heirloom is kind of a lame quest you can think about it from a gameplay perspective. Paya gets upset that the orb she was protecting is stolen, you see a suspicious individual, and then you stalk him and then kill a Yuga Clan guy. However, I love how it fleshes out the world with this guy being an ex Yuga Clan member whose wife was killed as punishment for leaving. The only real problem is that it makes me sad that the game didn't lean into its darker elements as much as it could have. Guardian Slideshow has you taking a picture of several guardians in order to get this orb back from this strange individual. The only thing worth noting here specifically is that I had a bit of difficulty finding the smaller guardian since I had no idea that it was referring to the ones found in shrines. Other than that, a perfectly decent quest and not much more. The bird in the mountains has you looking for a spot in the mountains that looks somewhat like a bird that houses a shrine. I think that it's cool that they made a spot that looks like a bird from a certain location. It makes me wish that they did more stuff like this in the game, but whatever. Not much else to talk about with this one. Recital at Warbler's Nest has you tracking down a bunch of Rito children, with one of them requiring you to make a meal for them. After this, you need to shoot an arrow through these rocks in the correct order based on the lyrics of the song. Not too terribly interesting, but not necessarily bad either. The ancient Rito song has you gathering, as the name would suggest, two halves of an ancient Rito song in order to figure out that you need to light fire on the shrine pedestal. Another example of not technically needing to start the quest to open the shrine, but it's basically impossible if you don't start it. Ceremonial Song has you taking a replica of Mipha's trident and stabbing the shrine pedestal with it. Not much to really say. Cliffside Etchings has you venturing into the cliffside to find a pedestal that you need to shoot with a shock arrow. The only thing that's really worth noting here is that the quest giver's name is Geggle, which I find pretty humorous. Shrouded Shrine is a really fun quest where you need to navigate a pitch black forest. It's a lot of fun since you can't really see and have to rely on your fire weapons or torches. And since there's no real way to orient yourself, you need to keep a mental map in order to try and get your bearings. Overall, one of the best quests in the game. Likewise, Trial of Thunder is also a really fun challenge. You need to get a bunch of colored orbs over to the center platform, which is tricky since it's constantly a thunderstorm here. You need to think of how you can position both the ball and yourself to get where you need to go. It's made a lot easier if you have Revali's Gale, but it doesn't completely circumvent the challenge if you do use it. You also have the Korok Trials that the aforementioned Koroks have set up for you. Lost Pilgrimage is my least favorite, since it can be difficult to spot where the Korok you're supposed to be following is, but it's still a pretty fun stealth section. Trial of Second Sight has you following a set of trees that are hungry. Basically, it just means to follow the trees that have something in their mouths. It gets kind of interesting at the end, with you needing to find a chest and transfer from the mouth of one tree to the mouth of another. An enjoyable, if a smidge mundane quest. The Tets of Wood is my favorite trial, with you being forced to use a bunch of wooden tools that you can't break or unequip without having to restart the entire quest. Of course, the game throws a bunch of fire enemies at you, but it's a pretty fun task to complete that's engaging and fun the whole time. Much like the side quests, I saved the best shrine quest for last, Stranded on Eventide. Stranded on Eventide is such a cool quest, with all your weapons and gear being stripped from you, requiring you to get these orbs over to their pedestals. What really makes this quest so cool is the fact that you need to do everything in one try, so there's a real sense of risk and reward throughout the entire challenge. Overall, the side activities in this game can be quite repetitive, but gosh darn it I don't mind. As long as there's something to do in Hyrule, I'll do it. The good quests are great, and the worst ones are easily ignorable, making for an incredibly engaging play experience. I do wish that there was more quality than quantity here, but it's not something that actively ruins the game.
Breath of the Wild shares a similar problem to Skyward Sword that I've previously mentioned that we finally get to go a bit more in depth with. In Skyward Sword, the dungeon design bled into the overworld, and in Breath of the Wild, the overworld design bled into the dungeons. This has negative consequences for the Divine Beasts as a whole, though I feel like I'm more forgiving of them than anyone else is. This is primarily because they are radically different from any other type of dungeon in the series. If they were the primary dungeons in any other Zelda game, then I would probably despise them. But in the context of the rest of the game, I can't say that they're all that bad. I mean, there are these giant robots you can find across the land that you need to engage in battle with before boarding them, only to discover that they're this game's take on dungeons. Within that context is where they thrive. They can easily be broken down into a sort of three-act structure. Get to the village that the Divine Beasts are terrorizing and completing a quest to get the champion standing to help you. Then you engage in battle with the Divine Beast and finally you board and complete the dungeon. So let's get into it. Due to Vometo being the only Divine Beast that you can see from the start of the game being this strange dark thing off in the distance, I can at least understand it being the easiest of the Divine Beast quests to start and finish. You literally just get there and you're golden. The other three have to do with dealing with a certain climate, whereas Rito Village's challenge has you trying to cross a gap. Not exactly the most interesting thing that they could have done. After that, you have to get to the flight range, which is fairly close by. Then they do an incredibly easy target minigame. And I get that the game needs to make sure that you can hit the targets for the battle that you're going to have with the Divine Beast, but it is seriously pathetic how little effort it takes to clear this section. Varuda has perhaps the most interesting climate-based challenge of any of the Divine Beasts, with it constantly raining. This makes it impossible to climb, meaning that the developers can make a lot of interesting challenges that are more difficult to get around than they would be otherwise. The first challenge involves you having to go down this trail, with enemies of course having electric weapons that do extra damage in the rain. So you need to find out how to take care of them, either just winging it and throwing yourself at them if you have shock resistance food, or you could try to snipe them from far away. Once you actually get to the domain, you find out that you need to get shock arrows. Instead of just getting them, you need to go up to the top of a nearby mountain where a Lionel resides. This leads into the stealth section that I mentioned earlier in the video. After this, you engage in battle with it. Varudania's challenge is with the extreme heat that sets you on fire. You really can't take the hits and eat since you'll take damage so fast that it's just a waste at that point. The most obvious way to overcome this extreme heat is with a fireproof elixir. Once you get there, you need to head over to the mines where you need to find Yunobo, a young Goron. This section is pretty fun, with Lozalpo shooting fire arrows at you along with some of that sweet navigational puzzle solving that I crave so much, with these air gusts that you need to find, as well as thinking logically about how you'll get from one island to the next. Von Naboris has you first needing to find a good way to get around Gerudo Desert. After that, you'll find out that men aren't allowed in Gerudo towns, you'll need to go and get some clothes that make you look like a Gerudo. It's kind of ridiculous how easy it is to get in though, since we eventually learned that Cass also managed to trick the guards into letting him in the same way, and the chief and her bodyguards see right through your disguise immediately as well. Uh, once you do manage to get there, you'll have to recover the Thunder Helm from the Yiga Clan hideout. I hate it. There are a couple of things that I like about it. I love how the Yuka Clan members love bananas and you can distract them with that. I also like how short it is. That's about it though, let's get into what I hate. First of all, I hate how you're not allowed to skip it. It seems like it would be easy to get to Koga early, but no. He doesn't spawn in unless you go through the hideout, which goes completely against the point of the game being about player choice. It's really easy to go in from above, but you can't do that to initially beat him, which is pretty stupid. If you get caught by one of the Yiga Clan members, instead of having a more difficult time trying to get through it, like with the Lionel and Ploymus Mountain, you basically insta-fail because they can kill you in one hit, regardless of how much health you have. And I know that I literally just said that it being so short was a positive thing just a second ago, but that's only because of how little enjoyment I get from this section. The fact that it's so short makes it feel almost worthless in a way. There's only like three rooms, you can find a pile of bananas stashed away, which is pretty funny I guess, but outside of that? It just kind of sucks. The next act is the battle that you have with the Divine Beasts, and these moments are some of the most thrilling, if short, moments in the whole game. Vometo's fight has you in the air, making shots at the cannons assaulting you. It's pretty fun, and positioning yourself to hit the cannons isn't as pathetically easy as the targets minigame you played to get to this point. It's kind of fun, but also mindless. Varuda is a lot better in this regard. While you have a lot less control in your movements, it makes it so that way the game can focus on a more demanding challenge. During the downtime of you waiting to get a shot up into the air, the beast sends a bunch of ice your way. 
There are a few ways to take care of them. You could use stasis to stop it, shoot them with arrows, or use cryonis to shatter them. It's really engaging all throughout. Then you get to one of these mini waterfalls that it's pouring out to shoot up into the air, making a precise shot to disable the beast, allowing you to board it. Varudania has by far the best boarding sequence in the game. It's a cell section that has you having to find a way around a bunch of Guardian Skywatchers. It's not enough to just get around them though, you also have to make sure that Yunobo can get to the next cannon since you can only attack the beast with him. There are a variety of ways that you can take care of them, with the most fun being to use the environment. And while it is a stealth mission, getting spotted doesn't result in an instant failure. Instead you just have to avoid the rock shower being thrown your way. It still punishes you for screwing up, but not in a frustrating way. Which is especially important since your companion is Yunobo, and if you're not careful, he can be spotted. Overall, one of the biggest highlights of the game. Finally, there's Von de Borsch's fight, which is probably the best of the more fast-paced one-on-one duels you have with the beasts. There's a bit of a risk-reward element with it, with you needing to stay in this bubble, allowing you to not be electrocuted with you needing to hit the beast's feet. And not much to really say other than that. Finally, let's get into the actual Divine Beasts. Each of them follow a certain pattern, with you first needing to locate a map, activate the five terminals, and then ending with you returning to the start to engage in a fight with one of the four Blights. The dungeons range in quality and difficulty, however for the most part I think that they're fresh enough to prevent them from feeling like disappointments. For as much as I love the dungeons from Skyward Sword, I can't deny how exhausting the formula was getting by that point. No matter what I say regarding these dungeons, they are at the very least unique in the pantheon of Zelda dungeons. The main thing that really sets these ones apart from previous entries is that they move. Now this isn't exactly the most groundbreaking thing ever, I mean Stone Tower Temple also involved the dungeon moving. These ones are different though since you can move them at any time, and in more ways than just upside down or right side up, which means that they can not only be used for puzzles but also for traversing around the dungeon. And their non-linearity means that they can be approached in a variety of different ways. Unfortunately, it also makes them a lot shorter than quote unquote real dungeons. Vameto is the weakest divine beast in the game. Despite the fact that the Rito are the best species in the game, it doesn't save it. The entire thing is kind of pathetically easy. It's a shame too, since this is really the only dungeon to make full use of puzzles based off of the movement of the beast. But those puzzles are all really simple. All you need to do here is just use Magnesis to hold the thing in place. This is pretty much every puzzle in the dungeon. You never have to think about any of them. It's also the only dungeon in the game that doesn't really use the movement to move through the dungeon. You can beat the whole thing without using the map screen once. There are these blocks they could have used for something, but no. I will say that it is at very least a fun 15 minutes, and it also has the best dungeon music in the game. It's the one that gets stuck in my head the most. I guess while we're on the topic of dungeon music real quick, I think that these are some of the best tracks in the series. I also love the small detail that they all have the SOS signal beeping in the background, but Vometo's beeping comes in a lot later since the pilot was Revali, and he was a big narcissistic jerk. It's great stuff. Anyway, Meadow is a mediocre dungeon, moving on. Varuda is the beast with the best flow. You start here at the bottom, get up to this part with the cogs, and then you climb up them to the top of the dungeon before you go back to the entrance to fight Water Blight Ganon. Other than that, it's a bit of an improvement over Vometo. The puzzles are all mostly timing and location based. Once again, these puzzles are all pretty eh. What I will say about this one is that there's a lot more of that sweet, sweet navigational puzzle solving. But it's different from previous Zelda dungeons. In those ones, you have to figure out where you can and can't go with the limitation that the current state of the dungeon has provided you with. Here though, it takes on a different approach. With you already knowing where you need to go, all you need to do is figure out how to get to where you need to go. While this is pretty nice here, Varuda shows you what happens when you don't go as far with this navigational puzzle solving as you can. It barely scratches the surface here since it's just a matter of moving the trunk to a certain spot. It makes it so that there's no real thought or effort that goes into solving anything. Uh, with this version of that thing I like a lot, the less options you have, the better as we'll see with the next two beasts. Here there are just too many different locations to move the trunk to, which means that it only takes a couple of tries if you somehow manage to get stuck. But you probably won't get stuck since the terminals are all really easy. The first one you just crank this handle to raise it up, stop this wheel at the right time, stop this wheel at the right time as well. Get to the tip of the trunk, douse these flames. 
None of these are difficult, and with the lackluster navigation, it makes Varuda overall feel just kind of okay. Varudania is when things start getting really good. This dungeon really gets the navigational puzzle solving thing more than the previous two. Firstly, there are only two ways that you can move the beast, which already leads to a lot more interesting navigation through the dungeon. Not only that, the two positions are very drastic, so you need to think about what to do before you actually move the beast. The puzzles here are also pretty decent. This one with the ball is the one that they try to utilize with the movement the most, and just like the puzzles in Vomito, it's really simple. You just have to move the beast a couple of times. They don't really try to do anything interesting with the ball and its path. The other puzzles aren't too bad though. I really like the opening of the dungeon with you having to navigate this central room in pitch blackness. It's the only one of the four to try something different with its opening sequence, which is one of the main reasons that this bit sticks out so much. This one part always screws me up since it doesn't make much sense to light an arrow that's already on fire with a blue flame, and my inability to notice anything makes spotting this spot on the ceiling impossible for me, so that's something I can use to pad out this video to reach its runtime. I don't know, there's really not a lot to the puzzles to really talk about. They rely a lot on looking around your surroundings for stuff. The overall structure of the dungeon also doesn't really lead to a lot of interesting puzzle ideas since it's all in one central room with four branching out from it. The only interesting stuff really comes with the outside of the dungeon, though it's unfortunate there isn't much to do out here. There's only one terminal and getting the ball to start rolling. Despite its issues, I have a lot more fun with this beast in comparison to the other two. Vonaboris is the best dungeon in the game, obviously. Despite what I said earlier, I do think that there is another way to make this type of navigational puzzle solving well. Instead of limiting your options, you could also give the player so many options that they need to think critically and intentionally about how they traverse through the dungeon. This is where Von Naboris really shines. There's so many different combinations that these three chambers can be in, so you can't just move stuff around and hope for the best. The structure is also the most confusing of any of the Divine Beasts. Not only do you have this central chamber, but you have little pockets that lead to the exterior of the beast, a room up top here, and this large section at the top of the beast that you can access via the tail. It feels truly massive, meaning that you need to really think critically of everything you do. This is the only divine beast that feels like it has a proper puzzle motif throughout the whole thing, that being electricity. One of the better puzzles involves having to create a current throughout the spine of the beast to raise the tail. However, it will rise before you can get onto it, so you'll need to intentionally break the line in order to get to the top. This ball section always perplexes me without fail since I can never find the easy ball. Seriously, I always spend like 30 minutes just wandering around trying to find the ball, and then I give up and try to use the cool method of dropping all my metal weapons and arranging them, but I'm always like too short, so then I go back on the hunt and find the ball in two minutes. Now this has happened with my last three playthroughs, and no, I am not kidding. The exact same set of events has happened to me three times in a row. Anyway, the main problem that I have with this dungeon is the general lack of connections the puzzles have in relation to one another. One of the terminals just requires you to rotate the chambers correctly, which is pretty alright since it gives some real thought to move everything correctly. But what does it have to do with finding two balls to open a gate? Or what does having to use electricity to light up two bulbs by moving a handle have to do with anything? I like these puzzles individually, especially with the crank and having to realize that one direction moves the left bulb and the other direction moves the right one, but their lack of cohesion is kind of disappointing. It also has some of the least interesting electricity puzzles in the game, with the more interesting ones being saved for shrines. The only interesting qualities come from factors outside the electricity element. In fact, this is kind of an issue with all of the Divine Beasts. The puzzles feel like leftovers, which improves the shrines, but it's kind of a detriment to the main dungeons. It also doesn't help that the dungeons all have to be designed as the potential first that the player comes across. This means that even if they wanted to make a complex dungeon, they wouldn't be able to, since they don't want to overwhelm the player. Overall, I like the Divine Beasts, but I wish that they didn't have all these issues, since I can see the potential that they have. Now here's hoping that future entries take what worked here and really expand everything. We're not done with this section yet though, since we still have to talk about Hyrule Castle. The castle is at the center of the map, and like the moon in Majora's Mask, it kind of taunts you throughout the game. 
This makes the final confrontation with Calamity Ganon really climactic. Storming your way through Hyrule Castle at the end of the game is one of the best moments in the entire series. There's so many different ways to navigate through the castle, whether it's through the main road that sees you fighting several different Lynels, or climbing along the sides of the castle utilizing the many waterfalls. There's no way to get up to the Sanctum that isn't satisfying. I also love how as you approach Ganon the sky changes to be this blood red sunset kind of color. It really heightens the climax by that little bit more. However, Hyrule Castle has a bit of an issue, that being that it secretly houses a pretty interesting take on dungeons. It's got a really big focus on exploration with the smaller overworld type puzzles filling it. There is so much to find here that you could spend hours combing over everything before you're done. There are tons of enemies to fight, cool loot to grab, and just a bunch of goodies in general. If you fight a Stalnox hidden in one of the rooms in the dungeon, you can get the Hylian Shield. You could come across it by complete accident and I love that. You can find the Diaries of Zelda and King Rom Boss Rama's Hyrule, which both add a little bit more context to the story and their characterizations. And you can uncover these by complete chance, which is cool since only players with the initiative to uncover every last detail of the story will really discover this. And there are a lot of different areas to discover too, like the previously mentioned dungeons, a library, the docks with a sweet minecart section, the gar towers, and so much more. This is easily one of my favorite places to just explore in the game. Of course, and there's the discussion of whether or not it counts as a dungeon, and personally, I'd consider it as one, since the only other places that have a map like this are the Divine Beasts. It's pretty clear that at the very least, the dev thoughts of this place like a dungeon. By that logic, this is the best dungeon in the game. It's still very different from the other dungeons since those have rigid structures and are more intentionally designed in comparison to Hyrule Castle's more open, free-flowing structure. Overall, the dungeons in Breath of the Wild lay out a great blueprint for the future of dungeons in the series, but they have a lot of little things that prevent them from being truly great. There are a ton of great ideas in them that I hope don't get abandoned in future titles. Because while they all have less interesting puzzles, similar aesthetics, and are a bit too short, they are all a lot of fun and bring a new, interesting spin on navigational puzzle solving that is practically begging to be brought back in the future. Get ready to hear this music for the next number of minutes, I ain't changing it at all for this section. The shrines in Breath of the Wild are essentially mini dungeons, 120 dotting the map. With them being supplements to the Divine Beast, it makes it so that this game doesn't lack in the dungeon department. However, since they are so self-contained and you constantly dip in and out of them, it means that the overall puzzle design and whatnot from previous entries is kind of lacking here. But I really enjoyed the shrines overall here, there are a lot of great puzzles that are fun and satisfying to figure out. But before we get into that, we need to talk about the shrines I don't really like. I've already talked about the problems I have with blessing shrines earlier, so I won't waste too much time on that again, but the shrines themselves are pretty boring and the only interesting thing that they offer comes from unlocking them, which is usually pretty hit or miss. The second set of shrines that I don't like that much are the Test of Strength shrines, and it all comes down to how tedious and repetitive they are. The first time you do one, especially if it's a major one, it's a pretty fun combat challenge. But then every time you go back, it's the same old thing. You attack them for a bit until they jump back, hide behind a pillar so they can crash into it, allowing you to get more hits in. Rinse and repeat until you whittle its health down, leading to the second phase, where it will fire a laser in a circle so you'll have to use your paraglider to glide over it. Shoot it with arrows until it's stunned. Run up to it and deal some damage. Rinse and repeat until the final phase where it charges up a laser attack, so you have to start hitting it over and over before it fires. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, it's just that it's always the same thing every time. They try very effortlessly to change things up, like sometimes you'll have to use Magnesis to lift the pillar up, and sometimes you'll have to use Cryonis to create a pillar for it to run into. Wow, how inspired. And that's not even taking into account how the shrine doesn't account for the player potentially breaking their weapons, bows, and whatnot. Though that is an issue with the shrines in general, not specific to just the test of strength shrines. There's no worse feeling than being forced to leave a shrine because you don't have the necessary materials required to beat it, which is why I usually come into these shrines heavily overprepared. It's a rough spot that I hope gets smoothed out with future titles. 
Now the honor of the worst shrines in the game goes to the worthless, agonizingly frustrating apparatus shrines. I despise these shrines far more than any other type in the game. They are the one and only thing that ruins my theory of the game being primarily developed with handheld in mind, because there is no way that the developers actually saw this and said it was okay. Or maybe they did, considering it made it into the final release. You have to angle and contort your wrists in ways that they were never designed to, and it makes them so irritating and literally painful to play. And what's worse, even if you disable motion controls in the menu, you still have to control these stupid things with motion controls. That makes so little sense, it's baffling. Why? Which of the hundreds of designers let that slip past? There is no good reason why disabling motion controls shouldn't disable them for the apparatus shrines. Then you have the puzzles of the shrine, which are mostly just a test of patience. Like getting the balls onto the switches, or getting the ball through the maze. The only one that was even the slightest bit interesting to me was the golfing one, since you have to figure out how much you had to move the controller. Even then though, it still sucks. Toto Saw Apparatus is one of the only not stupid instances of these kinds of gyro puzzles. It's more about moving everything to make a path for yourself. It's still not great, but it's better than nothing. Overall, it's just kind of weird that two Zeldas in a row had the same exact issue with bad motion controls. The rest of the shrines are pretty fun though, and all add up to the game having a fun dungeon experience. The first set of shrines on the Great Plateau are all really basic and are mostly just there to introduce the idea of runes to the player. However, I'd argue that the Plateau at large does a far better job of showing the applications of the runes than the shrines, since there's a lot more interesting things you can do with them outside of these areas. I'd say that Stasis is probably the best showcase with you freezing a gear across a bridge, teaching you about good timing. Then you freeze a ball, teaching you about optimal freezing points, and ending with you learning about the movement applications of the rune. Magnesis is also pretty good at teaching you the use of the rune, but there's a lot more utility with Magnesis than Stasis, so it's not quite as good as the Stasis trial. Other shrines teach you game mechanics, like the wind guides you, which teaches you about currents. Uh, the problem with these kinds of shrines though, is that the process of solving them is really lame. Crossing a gap has no challenge associated with it, there aren't multiple paths that you need to pay attention to, it's effectively a glorified straight line. Drifting is really the peak of this type of teaching shrine, with you learning about water currents. Here the difference is that there are a few different ways you can get through the water, whether it's these planks or crossing it via cryonis. It also highlights the problem with shrines like The Wind Guides You, that being that there are no puzzles to speak of. There technically isn't any here either, however having to find a way to cross the water and blowing up this pillar is enough to trick you into experiencing a puzzle like feeling, so I give it a pass. Some of the shrines that are about that sweet puzzle solving leave a bit to be desired, like passing the flame. All you need to do is burn a couple of things and then you've completed the shrine, so if you have any fire arrows it's over in less than 2 minutes. If you don't have any, then the shrine's pretty cool with you having to figure out how to burn stuff. Metal makes a path is also pretty pathetic since you just need to shove a metal ball through its own ones, and it is really non-challenging. I didn't leave anything out by the way, the shrine is really that lame. However, for the most part, shrines are fantastic and fun, with these being the only two examples of shrines I specifically called out in my notes that I didn't particularly like. Windmills is a really enjoyable shrine. This one has you having to move fans in order to make all of these windmills spin. The puzzle is great, since it involves you having to pay attention to what mills will be activated by what fans, so in order to really solve it, you need to think critically about how you move the fans. You could just brute force it, but that isn't nearly as satisfying or quick as some good old critical thinking. However, one of the best shrines in this region of the map is Wind Guide. The main idea is moving yourself through the air, with you having to move yourself through the shrine on floating platforms, needing to take care in not popping the balloons. Uh, you also need to move an explosive barrel, and the whole thing overall is just really fun. Keeping to this theme of wind shrines, Path of Hidden Winds is another shrine I enjoy, even if it is a little simple. As the name would imply, you need to find a hidden wind current. It makes the solving process fun. You just need to pay attention to how you move through the space to make it where you need to go, especially when it comes to finding the hidden current, which is a different, more interesting take on the wind guides you. Some of the best shrines in the game are all orb shrines. Twin memories are some of the standouts, since in order to beat them you need to visit both shrines, since the placement of the orbs when you first enter is where they need to be placed in the other shrine. It's a really creative puzzle and one of the strongest parts of the dungeon side of Breath of the Wild. Of course, the highlight of this kind of shrine is with Fateful Stars. 
This is by far the most confusing shrine in the entire game, and it's not hard to see why. Basically, the whole thing has to do with consolations in the shrine itself, since they show you where to place the orbs. That's not the actual solution though, since it's actually the number of consolations you count on the wall that tells you what row and column you need to place an orb. This makes it way more confusing and fun to solve, since it first requires realizing what you need to do, and then figuring out what to do with the information once you have it. This might just be the best puzzle in the entire game, it is really good. It still trips me up on repeat playthroughs, which doesn't usually happen with most puzzles in Zelda games. Blue Flame is one of the few shrines that feels like it has proper progression of its main idea. Basically, the whole shrine is dedicated to the idea of transferring a blue flame throughout the shrine, and there are a lot of cool ideas that they came up with that make progressing through the shrine really interesting. You'll need to get the flame under two streams of water, then you'll need to get the flame over a long distance, then you'll need to figure out a way to light these two flames at the same time, since water will spray out of these taps when you light the torch. Then you need to light two torches within a certain time frame, since there's water constantly streaming out that will put the flames out. After this, you need to move the flame underneath another stream of water, this time using magnesis to move a block. Then you get to the final puzzle where you have to perform a spin attack to light a circle of torches. It's an incredibly strong shrine that feels like it explores its puzzle idea to its fullest extent. But that's a shrine that everyone likes to bring up, so let's talk about one that isn't talked about as much that still has a similar progression, even if not as good as Blue Flame. The shrine that I've selected for this comparison is On The Move, a pretty solid one that sees you trying to maneuver around a conveyor belt and getting the orb into its pedestal. There are three different scenarios that you come across, each one relating to the overall theme of the shrine. The first puzzle has you freezing the orb with stasis and then shooting it with an arrow to knock it into the pedestal. The next one has you doing the same thing, but this time you have to deal with guardian scouts. Then you have the actual good room, where you have to move through lasers carrying the ball. You have to think about timing and getting these stone blocks into a good position so you can cross unscathed, as well as freezing the lasers. While the progression isn't quite as good as Blue Flame, the shrine does feel like it explores the idea well. The classic Nintendo design philosophy is where the shrines really excel at, introducing you to the concept in a safe environment, not allowing you to progress until you're sure that you understand the concept. Then having you perform the same task with a safety net being removed, and then finally turning the concept on its head for the last one. It only took me 5 videos before I brought up Nintendo design philosophy, are you proud of me yet? I'm finally a real generic Nintendo YouTuber. Anyway, there are a few shrines that don't really do that. Take another shrine from Elden Region, Stalled Flight. This one has you launching yourself up and then progressing through the shrine that way. There really aren't any puzzles here, you just launch yourself up, use stasis to stop a block, and then glide your way to the end. I feel like there's more that you could do with this concept than what they actually ended up using it for. Swinging Flames is a shrine that you can either solve by using fire type weapons and arrows to overcome every puzzle, or you can actually try to solve the puzzles of lighting the leaves and wood on fire with the limited supply of flammable materials in the shrine. Even if you do use fire stuff though, the puzzles don't actually revolve around burning stuff. The majority are actually based around some of that navigational puzzle solving, with a bunch of switches that you need to press in the right order with the right timing in order to succeed. It's a shrine that feels really tightly designed. Everything is very constrained, and due to my lack of ability to notice basic things, it made for a very fun shrine. The name does give away an element of the puzzle solving though, however it's not quite as bad as two bombs. The main puzzles here both have to do with using two bombs. It's a really cool puzzle too, but the name of the shrine already tells you that you need to use two bombs. I guess that finding out how you're supposed to use the two bombs is kind of interesting, but it would have been way more interesting to have to first realize that you need to use two bombs, and then figure out how you're supposed to use them. It's still a really good shrine though. The best shrines in the game are in the Gerudo Desert though. Gotten surprising, of course, considering that the best Divine Beast is also located there. The main reason for this is because the majority of Gerudo Shrines deal with electricity, and the puzzle scenarios that arise from this idea are a lot more compelling than the rest of the shrines. The whole picture is a pretty good example of this. The shrine is all about taking what limited metal items there are in the shrine and using them to open up the gates. If you don't have a ton of metal weapons, then this shrine becomes really fun, with you having to think about which metal object to use to bridge the gap. You really have to look at the floor and what circuits lead to what thing, it's a super fun shrine to figure out. The current solution seems pretty lame at first, but it's actually one of the best shrines in the game. Once again, it follows Nintendo design philosophy by first making you complete an electrical circuit. 
Then you need to try and move a metal ball chained to the wall to complete another circuit to raise this platform so you can get up to this other ball. Once you have the ball, you then need to move it without activating any of the circuits since if you do, the platform will flip. There's some guardian scouts here that will prevent your progress so you'll need to take care of them. You'll get to the last section where you place the ball down and the door doesn't open. That's because you need to find a cog in the other room. This room is a sliding block puzzle, where you're trying to line up the blocks to complete a circuit. It's pretty tricky, and it is a bit too finicky, but it's still a fun puzzle trying to figure out how you're supposed to move the blocks in such a way that everything lines up. The actual solution is really simple, but getting to that point requires you to pay attention and move everything correctly. You'll then get the cog, and complete the shrine. Electric Path is one of my favorite shrines in the game. You start by crossing this gap and then you need to take this electric cube that powers the platform and hold it in a position that will power the platform to get the cube over to the other side of it. You then need to take the cube and use it to power another moving platform so you can ride it up. Then you have to find a certain location to place the cube which can be kind of tricky since there's a lot of noise that can distract you from what you actually need to do. After that you ride across this platform to the monk. It's a fairly simple shrine and yet it still has that satisfying feel to completing it that makes it really enjoyable since you have to think about how to move the cubes to progress. Before I end this section I'd like to talk about two more shrines that stood out enough for me to mention them in my notes that I didn't really feel like I could fit in with the flow of the section. A balanced approach is neat with you having to raise the scale in order to cross this gap. I feel like this is a shrine where the way in which you solve it really determines how good it is. There's a few different ways you can raise the scale, and because of that, there are some solutions way less satisfying than others. Red Giveaway is just a slightly more complex of another shrine, and it's a lot better than the other one, as well as being one of my favorites in the game. Your goal is to get an orb over to this pedestal. The puzzle aspect comes from the fact that you need to get around these wind currents pushing the orbs in places you don't want it to go. So you need to find which ones you need to block and when. But, but then there's a problem of making sure the orb gets into the pedestal after you get on the platform which rises once it gets in. It's a very fun shrine. Overall, the shrines in Breath of the Wild are pretty fun, one-off puzzles. It is a little unfortunate that this game doesn't really have a clear sense of puzzle progression like previous entries, however, after playing this immediately after those entries, I can safely say that Breath of the Wild does not lack in the dungeon department. I hope that this concept is further fleshed out in future titles and isn't abandoned because if they just implemented better puzzle progression then these shrines would honestly be perfect. I honestly believe that with a little fine tuning this concept could finally reach its full potential. The bosses in Breath of the Wild are one of the most refreshing elements of the game. No longer are they reliant on having the key to defeat them lay in getting the dungeon item with lots of repetition, boredom, and ease in how you defeat them. Instead, the bosses are designed around damaging them, with the weak points merely doing extra damage, not being the primary way you hurt them. I find pretty much all of them fun, yet another way in which I am a contrarian. I wouldn't necessarily say they're my favorite, but they're fun regardless. First up, the Lionel. I know that they're technically an enemy, but they're difficult enough to fight for me to classify them as a boss. There are a few different types, though all of them share the same attacks and such, the only real difference being their health. One thing that makes Lionel so difficult is that you can only really fight them in close quarters. This is because they have perfect aim and can instantly kill you with one of their arrows. Then you have a variety of different attacks, jumping back so that they can rush you or breathe a bunch of fire at you. They hit hard when up close, so in order to beat them you need to be good at parrying and dodging. You can also stun the Lionel in order to mount it and do some decent damage that way. Overall, they are fun endurance rounds and stand out as some of the best combat encounters in the game. Now onto what the game actually considers a boss. The Stone Talus is likely to be the first boss that the player comes across, with one being located on the Great Plateau and another being placed along the path to Kakariko. The most interesting part about these bosses is that you have to attack the ore vein located on it. Its attacks are all relatively easy to avoid, with the two main ones being an attempt to slam you into the ground and the other being to throw big rocks at you. Actually climbing it to deal damage can be pretty tricky and is where the majority of the fun trying to face this boss lies. You have to wait for it to be in the optimal position before you even think about climbing it, and even then, you only have a few seconds to take advantage of the opportunity. 
You could also try shooting the vein with an arrow, however it does significantly less damage, even if it is the safer option of the two. There are also two variations of the boss, the Igneo Talus and the Frost Talus. As you might assume from the names, the Igneo Talus is on fire and the Frost Talus is made of ice. And the two have attacks that correlate to this as well. The fight is largely the same, but you do need to use ice and fire arrows that not only make it take some damage, but also allows you to climb it without getting hurt. Overall, I like the boss, even if it is a little simple. The Hinox can be a pretty fun boss, though it does feel a little like a generic Zelda boss. Hitting it in the eye, apart from doing the most damage, also stuns the Hinox for a bit. Once they've taken enough damage, they'll actually cover their eye, which means that you won't be able to get easy damage as easily and have to find other ways to damage it. Some of them have armor that you can damage with either fire arrows for wooden armor or shock arrows for metal armor. The attacks of a Hinox take full advantage of the fact that this is a massive creature, with the most notable being that they will take trees and use it as a club. They are also the only boss in the game that has a stall version of them. The stall Nox is pretty much the same fight as a regular Hinox, with one key exception. In order to actually finish them off, you need to attack the eye once it pops out of the skull. There's a limited opportunity to do this, however, and if you aren't quick enough, you'll have to try and repeat the process until you do eventually succeed. A decently fun boss. Now for what is easily the second worst boss in the game, Maldugo. The problem with this boss is that there's a strategy so simple yet overpowered that it makes the whole thing a complete joke. And that strategy is standing on a rock. The Maldugo can never even touch you if you're on a rock. So really all you have to do is stand on a rock, throw a bomb into the sand so that the vibrations are picked up, then when it comes up you detonate the bomb, wail on it, and then quickly get back to your rock. You could fight it on your sand seal, trying not to get caught and attempting to bait it to eat your bomb, but why would you even bother with that when it's so much simpler to just use the rock strat? Overall a weak boss and a low point of all of them, even including Dark Beast Ganon, but we aren't quite there yet. Now I get on to the main quest bosses, and to be honest with you, I am yet again a massive contrarian. I really enjoy the bosses in Breath of the Wild, and the aesthetic has never really been as important to me regarding bosses in Zelda games, so I don't really see what the problems people have with them in this game are. Sure, they all look the same, but the overall fights are very different, and have a different level of challenge associated with them. But before we get into the blights, we have another fight to talk about. Master Koga is really great. After the Yiga Clan hideout, you get introduced to the leader of the group, an oaf named Koga. The fight is really easy, but that's on purpose. He's meant to be a pushover, so the fight as a whole is more of a joke fight, which I am perfectly content with. The first phase has you hitting him with an arrow, so he drops a boulder on his head. Then you go up and attack him and repeat until the next phase where he'll do the same thing, except this time over the pit in the center of the room and having two boulders circling him, so you need to hit him with an arrow at the correct time. The last phase has you taking a giant spiked metal ball that he summons with Magnesis and damaging him with it. Again, there's not a lot to this fight, but it's fun and the payoff at the end is pretty funny. Alright, let's get into the actual dungeon bosses, the Blights. Wind Blight Ganon is okay. His main attacks are shooting lasers at you and sending tornadoes after you. These attacks are pretty easy to dodge and attacking him is pretty easy, especially if you have bomb arrows. The first phase and second phase don't really have any differences in terms of attacks, or at least there aren't any notable differences in attacks between the two phases. It can be a fun fight, but he's definitely one of the weaker bosses. Water Blight Ganon is a little more interesting. In the first phase, he has four main attacks, most for if you're further away and one for if you're closer. If you're further away, he uses his long spear to sweep across a room, he'll throw a spear, and if you're closer, he'll thrust his spear at you, or he'll stab the ground, causing a small damaging shockwave. This phase is kind of fun, though most of his telegraphs for these attacks result in the fight being just a little too easy. At the start of the second phase, he raises up some platforms, which makes the fight a little more interesting. His main attacks are thrusting his spear and summoning cryonis blocks and throwing them at you. This phase is a lot more interesting since you have to think about what the optimal place in the room is and then getting there as swiftly as possible. It's also just pretty fun to attack Water Blight. Overall, a pretty fun boss. Fireblight Ganon is the worst boss fight in the game, and it isn't even close. The main problem is that his weakness is too exploitable. You throw two bombs and he goes down instantly. This doesn't even change during the second phase. You still just throw two bombs at him and then run up and get your hits in. He's honestly pathetic, and there's no need to really talk about any of these attacks or the rest of the fight at large because what's the point? He's so easy that it defeats the point of talking about him. 
Much like how Von Boris is the best Divine Beast in the game, Thunderblight Ganon is the best Blight fight in the game, as well as being the unanimously agreed hardest boss in the base game. Keyword here, base. Now, I'm pretty sure that they specifically made Flurry Rushes easier to get in this particular instance. It is not as difficult to consistently pull it off on Thunderblight in comparison to other enemies slash bosses. Despite this, the boss can still be pretty challenging, and that's mostly due to his speed. He's a fast boy, so you have to try and keep your eye on him at all times so that dodging his attacks becomes easier. Whenever he isn't rushing you, he throws these electric balls at you that you have to avoid. The second phase is pretty much just more of the first. At least it is after the start, since the start of this phase has him sending a bunch of metal spikes down and strikes each of them with lightning, so you need to bring one of them close to him so that he shocks himself and allows you to finally start attacking him. I feel like a big reason why this fight seems so hard is because of how involved you have to be in to fight him, as well as him having the best defense of any of the blights. Overall, a really good boss. Before we get to talking about the final boss, I wanted to briefly mention one thing that every blight shares, which once again ties into the freeform nature of the game. That being the fact that there isn't a specific weak point on any of the bosses. Sure, the eye will do a little more damage and sun them for a brief period of time, but there's no set way to defeat them. You just do whatever you can to damage them and go for it. In my opinion, this makes them some of the most engaging bosses in the series since Majora's Mask. And whilst they do all share the same aesthetic design, I still haven't found a legitimate reason for why it makes them inferior. They're still intimidating, and the designs are cool. For this specific game, I think it works, so there's no real point in complaining about it. Alright, let's get into the final boss. When first getting to the Sanctum in Hyrule Castle, there was a rush of anticipation for the climactic final encounter with Calamity Ganon. Throughout the game, I wondered what the boss could possibly be like, given that I couldn't think of many ideas for how they could do it with the spectral form you see surrounding the castle. So imagine how shocking it was to walk in there and see this weird, disgusting cocoon. And then out pops this spider monster looking Ganon. That was one of the best moments I've ever had with any video game. It really threw me for a loop. As for the fight itself, it's definitely my favorite boss in the base game. Again, keyword base. There are a variety of attacks that he does, from sending rows of fire across the floor, to a variety of attacks all taken from the blights. It's a really fun test trying to dodge them all whilst also trying to damage him. Then you get to phase 2 where he becomes invincible, with the only real way to damage him being to parry the lasers he shoots at you back at him. He'll also crawl around the arena, which makes the fight a bit more engaging. It's such a mechanically satisfying boss that I can't really think of anything to really criticize it for, mechanically speaking. Because the developers made one crucial mistake with this boss that nearly ruins it. If you complete the main quest, because why wouldn't you, Calamity Ganon's health starts at half. It feels like they took the Majora's Mask approach without realizing why that approach worked so well. In Majora, you get an overpowered mask that makes quick work of the final boss if you decide to go out of your way to earn every mask in the game. You are rewarded for your exploration and completion of quests by having an easier final boss. In Breath of the Wild, however, you get an easier boss for simply completing the main quest. And not the full main quest either, just the Divine Beast parts of the main quest. It leads to the whole thing feeling very unsatisfying. Funnily enough, if you just ignore the main quest, then you get a way more fulfilling experience. A boss rush with all four blights leading into the final boss. To be honest, it really should have been inverted with every beast you defeat, that blight goes to Hyrule Castle. But no, you just have to settle for a way less interesting boss. Something that I never mentioned in previous videos is the classic struggle to have mechanical complexity whilst also being easily accessible for more casual players. This struggle to have a challenging boss while also allowing people to finish the game is where this struggle rears its head, and for the first time in any of these retrospectives, I feel that it's detrimental enough to the overall experience to call out. Hopefully in future titles this issue isn't as prevalent. Calamity Ganon is still a fun boss, I just wish that it were handled better. And then we have Dark Beast Ganon. I will, for at least the fourth time, become a contrarian and say that I actually kinda like this boss. It's still easily the worst final boss out of any of the 3D games, but it's hard for me to call it a bad boss because fundamentally, Dark Beast Ganon isn't a boss. It's a massive spectacle to end the game on. Riding around on a horse with this giant boar in the middle of Hyrule Field shooting light arrows at it is a really strong ending to the game. It's easy, but that's okay since so it's more of a victory lap than anything anyway. But of course, other Zelda games managed to have final bosses that were both a cool spectacle to end the game on, as well as being fun bosses in their own right. Demise is the best example of this. This cool looking dark void directing all of your attention to Demise with epic music in the background makes for a cool final spectacle. 
but it also manages to be a fun one-on-one -on -one sword duel, making full use of the sword play so heavily featured in the game. Comparatively, Dark Beast Ganon doesn't really do that. Horseback combat isn't a major focus, so it doesn't really feel like a final test. And his attack is pathetic, this slow-moving laser that can never hit you unless you actively try to get hit. But it does have a trick up its sleeve. This moment here. Gliding up and firing an arrow directly into his eye is the best ending bit to any Zelda game ever. Sure, delivering the final blow in Skyward Sword and Twilight Princess were both satisfying, but this one is a lot cooler since the skies grow blood red as you go up, with the music slowly building up to an epic conclusion, makes this moment feel a lot more impactful than those other games. Plus, it has the added benefit of being a moment built up to throughout the entire game. Skyward Sword's final boss comes as something you've been actively trying to avoid the entire game, and Ganondorf in Twilight Princess only really comes into play at the very end of the game. You know that eventually you'll storm into Hyrule Castle and take on Calamity Ganon, which adds up to making this moment so great. I really do wish that it was as mechanically interesting as the boss that preceded it, but it's a serviceable enough finale that I don't mind it too much. Overall, the bosses in Breath of the Wild offer entertainment, but it's difficult to think of anything else that they offer the player, especially with the final two. Now, this would normally be the part where I transition to my concluding thoughts, however, Breath of the Wild was the first Zelda game to have DLC. And seeing as how this is an all-encompassing retrospective, it felt wrong to not talk about it. So let's dive into the surprisingly meaty DLC content. This section of the DLC will be dedicated to everything in the DLC outside of the Champion's Ballad Shrines, the Trial of the Sword, and the final Divine Beast. With that said, let's get into what all was added to the game. Firstly, there are three things added to the Expansion Pass normally. A Nintendo Switcher that does nothing, a Ruby that also does nothing, and five bomb arrows that will inevitably get used up soon. Overall, not a particularly strong start to the DLC, However, the overall content that you get with them more than makes up for it. There are two halves of the DLC, the Master Trials and the Champion's Ballad. All of this adds up to make a very satisfying expansion experience. Two things that I will say are that Champion's Ballad is by far the better portion of the DLC than the Master Trials. Mostly because of the added shrines and Divine Beast. It's not like the Master Trials are bad or anything, but when it initially launched, I found it kind of underwhelming and disappointing. Like, not bad, but it was hard to justify the $20 price tag. And once I show you what there is to do outside of the main quest in the Champion's Ballad, you'll kind of see why the first set of DLC is so meh. The main piece of content that the Master Trial adds, in my opinion, is Master Mode. Basically a hard mode for the game. Enemies do more damage, stronger enemies appear much earlier, and they also regenerate health over time. And there are a few other things they added to the game to keep you on your toes, like a Lionel on the Great Plateau, and these floating platforms with enemies and chests scattered throughout the map. It's more challenging, though I can't help but feel like they could have gone further with it. Since it's a part of DLC and the only people who will get it will be those who really like the game, they could have gone further with it. Maybe pull an Ocarina of Time Master Quest where you flip the map and have a completely different redesigned, harder Divine Beasts. Maybe update a few of the shrines to be a bit more difficult too, really taking advantage of the fact that people have already played and beaten the game. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that only having access to it being to buy the DLC is a bad thing, because again, the DLC was made for people who already like the game anyway, and most people who would try Master Mode are people who like the game. It's just that it feels like they did as little as they could to make it more difficult. I really like it, it's the main way that I play the game, I just wish that they went further with it. Also, it does still share the same difficulty progression issue as the base game, Though even at its easiest, it's still harder than the base game, so there's that, I suppose. Another addition is Hero's Path. It's a fairly simple addition that adds the ability to see everywhere you've gone on the map for the past 200 hours, which is generally 150 hours more of my usual playtime, so it's interesting to see everywhere I went after stepping out of the Shrine of Resurrection. There's not much else to it, but it's a cool little addition nonetheless. The Champion's Ballad has a bit more going on, with the most interesting thing being the main quest. Basically, Cass is trying to complete a song his teacher started writing, which I think is a really fun way to frame it. We get to see a bit more characterization for the champions, though not nearly as much as Age of Calamity. The little bits that we do get are great though. 
like how Daruk is scared of dogs and how Zelda gets to pet them for some reason but not the player. However, I think the most interesting part of the quest is Cass. These aren't really memories, they're just a verse of Cass's song, just that instead of him singing about the actions, we see the actions he's singing about, if that makes any sense. Which is what makes the final moment when he finishes playing the song and getting an actual memory is so surprising. Also, I have no idea how he doesn't realize that this random Hylian he's been talking to is the same person that's in the picture. He's literally front and center, can't possibly miss him, but whatever. I like the story additions, it makes the whole thing feel more substantial, though in my opinion, it's one of the weaker elements of the DLC, with the shrines and dungeon being absolutely fantastic for the most part. Though, we'll get into that in the next couple of sections. Also, I forgot to script this part, so excuse my ramblings. But after you beat the dungeon, you get this cool photo that you can hang up in your house. Well, that's pretty cool. And also the main theme plays, so that's kind of interesting. I, I, I don't know. Just, just let me pad the video runtime out, thank you very much. The most substantial piece of content it has to offer that I'll talk about in this section is this one hit obliterator challenge on the Great Plateau. After you complete all the Divine Beast quests, you are instructed to return to the Shrine of Resurrection. Once arriving, you take this sweet weapon, the one hit obliterator. This weapon allows you to instantly kill any enemy in one hit. Of course, that would be too overpowered, so you will also die in one hit. And the weapon also takes some time to recharge after a few hits. Then you're tasked with traversing the plateau, taking out enemy camps to unlock shrines. It's a pretty fun challenge with you having to approach the enemy camps in a variety of different ways. There are a lot of different ways to approach them, with you having to plot out which enemies you want to take out from further away and which ones are worth killing with the obliterator. Each camp offers something different, with the two most interesting ones being the one in the forest and the one in the mountains. They're my favorite because these ones have a lot more to do with positioning yourself than the other two. It's pretty easy to get into a good position with the other two since there are a bunch of different barriers to take cover behind, whereas with these two without anything to take cover behind, you need to think about what a good position to start in would be, which makes them a lot more interesting to take on. And overall, one of the many highlights of the DLC, it's a fun challenge. The last thing to mention in this section would be the variety of side quests they added along with the armor since they're basically one and the same. It is a little unfortunate that most have to do with finding new armor, though it isn't that big of an issue since, hey, more side quests and some sweet armor. The first one is Strange Mask Rumors, which is actually referring to the Korok Mask and not Majora's Mask. This one has you going to the Lost Woods in order to locate the mask. You basically just go through the torches like you normally would, but instead of continuing to follow the embers in the wind like you would to get to Korok Forest, you just follow the first set of embers until you reach the chest. Now, if you recall what I said like an hour ago, I still have one more thing to mention about the Korok Seeds, that being how the mask affects collecting them. It will shake whenever you're near a Korok, it's primarily useful if you're a couple short and want enough to upgrade your inventory. This mask turns the Koroks from passive collectibles into active collectibles. It doesn't go against what I said earlier about Hesu's gift, since it doesn't really feel like it was implemented for the sole intent of allowing players to find all 900 Koroks, but rather to find a few specific ones so they can increase their inventory. Aren't you glad you stuck around for that? The Ancient Mask is the one that involves Majora's Mask, and it's kinda weird to think about how this is the same mask from the video game called The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, and not just a fun easter egg like in The Link Between Worlds. It was actually an artifact that some guy called Misko stole from the royal family of Hyrule. The game even points it out to you, since this book where you get the quests is obviously not in these ruins unless you purchase the DLC, so that's kinda interesting. Anyway, the quest is just going to the Colomo ruins and pulling out the chest with Magnesis. Majora's Mask is a pretty cool item, making you blend in with any enemy. There's not much else to it, just a cool armor piece, I guess. The best part of the Fairy Clothes quest is the fact that the royal family of Hyrule apparently considered the Clothes of Tingle a historically significant artifact. The first piece is located at the Exchange Ruins, brilliant because of Tingle's role in the Wind Waker as a frickin' leech. The other one is at a place where sinners were imprisoned, so, prison. A sweet reference to Wind Waker, where he's in prison. The final piece is located in the Mabe Village Ruins, though based on the hand it could be literally any Village Ruins. The cool boost that you get with this outfit is a nighttime speed boost, because I guess that since Tingle stole the Picto Box and Wind Waker, that means he's a thief and thieves usually work at night. That's the only reason I can think of. The Twilight Relic has you going to the Sage Temple Ruins to find Minna's helmet. It's fairly simple and requires no effort. Uh, when equipping it, you get Guardian Resistance. There's not much more to it other than a reference to Twilight Princess. Phantasma is the last quest that you find in Misko's journal, having you find an armor set that looks like the phantoms from the Phantom Hourglass in Spirit Tracks. 
The helmet can be found in the Colosseum ruins, the armor can be found in the Sacred Ground ruins, and the Greaves can be found in the Hyrule Garrison ruins. It looks kinda cool and gives you an attack up bonus. Royal Guard Rumors has you exploring the entirety of Hyrule Castle to get the Royal Guard outfit. One piece is located in the guard's chamber, another piece located in an offshoot of the dining hall, and the final piece is located on the second floor of the sanctum. Apart from looking kind of whatever, it gives you a pretty good offensive boost by consuming less stamina when charging up your weapons. It's also just a kind of fun treasure hunt throughout Hyrule Castle. For the Champion's Battle, there's another journal that leads you to more quests to get more armor. The first of these is the Merchant Hood, which is found in the Spring of Courage. Equipping it increases your climbing speed, but only sideways. I don't know why there's that specific stipulation, but it's kind of amusing, so I'll let it pass. Garb of the Winds has you going to Coral Lake to find a chest. Inside of this chest is the lobster shirt that Link wore at the start of the Wind Waker. It also provides a bit of heat resistance, which is a fun little throwback considering that that game started on a tropical island. Usurper King has you finding the Zant Helmet. Somehow I never even discovered this until this most recent playthrough of the game. Anyway, you can find it in Tabio's Hollow, a swamp just south of the Dueling Peaks. Equipping it makes you unfreezable, which is a weird buff considering it's Zant's Helmet, but overall it's kinda cool I guess. Dark Armor has you looking for Phantom Ganon Armor. Apart from looking really cool, it also increases your stealth and damage output when using bone weapons. I will say though that Majora's Mask does a better job at stealth and it's also way easier to find, so make of that information what you will. The armor is located in Sargent Woods, the helmet is located at the end of Korda Lake, not to be confused with Korra Lake to find the lobster shirt, and the greaves are found in the Ebera Forest, just east of the lake's out stable. And that is all the new armor that the DLC adds. One somewhat annoying thing about these armor sets is that none of the DLC armor can be upgraded at the Fairy Fountains. And I suppose it makes sense, but it doesn't mean it's not a little disappointing that this sweet looking armor doesn't really get much utility outside of looking cool. There are two more things we need to talk about before we move on to the shrines, however. Firstly, teleportation rumors. You get a travel medallion you can place anywhere in the world to teleport to at any given time. It's pretty convenient to say the least, particularly with the Under a Red Moon quest. It's found at the Lume Labyrinth in this one room filled with guardians. Needless to say, my first playthrough was pretty scary upon first opening this chest. And the final thing to talk about in this section is the ancient horse armor. You can find the bridle on Satori Mountain and it gives any horse two additional spurs, which makes them just that little bit faster, especially if you have a horse with five base spurs. The saddle is the cool piece of armor though, and it can be found in the Melania Spring. This saddle allows you to teleport the horse directly to you no matter where on the map they are, so it makes traversing with them a lot more fun since you can get them unstuck a lot easier. At least it's more fun until you complete the final trial where you get this sweet motorcycle. The fact that this piece of concept art made it into the final product means that anything is possible. This is easily the best reward for anything in the entire game. It's easier and more fun to get anywhere you need to go than anything else on foot. And it runs off of random items so if you're a hoarder you'll have nothing to worry about. I don't really have much to say about it other than the fact that dude, it's a sweet motorcycle. Overall, the things added to the base DLC that aren't special challenges are hit or miss. Looking for the new armor can be fun, but it's not enough of a hook to get me to spend $20. However, with a sweet motorcycle and a cool challenge on the Great Plateau, I wouldn't say that it's a complete waste. Besides, it doesn't really matter when the rest of the DLC is really good. So let's get into that. Aw oh, yeah, music's back baby. The DLC shrines in Breath of the Wild are some of the best in the entire game. There are a couple I don't like, but we'll get to them in a bit. First, let's start off with the shrines you complete on the Great Plateau. The most interesting part about the shrines on the Great Plateau is the fact that you still only have a quarter of a heart, so you can't take any damage in the shrines as well. This leads to the challenge coming from having to find a way to complete all the puzzles without taking any damage. Collected Soul is the first of these shrines. The main idea has to do with rolling balls and spiky balls. As the collected part of the name would suggest, what you need to do is collect a certain orb and place it into the pedestal. This can be needlessly difficult considering how easy it is to get hit, which will take away your health causing immense frustration. Otherwise, a pretty fun shrine. Stop to Start is perhaps my favorite shrine on the Great Plateau. 
It starts in this one section where you need to cross this spiked floor that's constantly shifting up and down. There are three metal objects that you can place in order to cross it. It can be a little tricky since the shifting floor will cause them to move, but if you place them right, you won't really have to worry about it. The next section has these gears that constantly move, so you'll need to find a way to stop it before it rotates you into these spike rows. It's not that tricky, you just have to be good with your timing. You have this section with these three spiked balls you need to glide around, so you'll need to decide which one you move out of the way with magnesis and which one you use stasis on, along with also requiring you to have good timing. Once you cross the gap, you get to the end of the shrine, where you have to cross this path with a spike wall coming from behind you, which forces you to run straight ahead with a bunch of pillars that jut out with spikes on the end, forcing you to stop and pay attention before advancing. After this, you collect your spirit orb. Overall, a pretty enjoyable shrine. A major test of strength plus is one of the most cathartic shrines in the game, since you have the one hit obliterator which instantly kills the guardian in front of you. However, it isn't that easy since there's an entire bottom floor after you kill the guardian. You'll head down a path and encounter a guardian scout, and since you have a quarter of a heart it means that it serves as a threat to you for the first time all game. Eventually you'll get the key and get to the final room with four guardian scouts. You can't really brute force this room since the other guardians make killing a certain one more difficult. In order to defeat all four, it requires a strategy as to which order you'll kill them and how you'll kill them. Overall, it is easily the best test of strength shrine in the entire game. Path of Light is a pretty cool shrine and the last of the new shrines on the Great Plateau. The most interesting part about it is that everything is pitch black, with fire, lasers, and these orb things are the only things that can produce light, which leads to a shrine that takes the opening section of Varudania and makes it far more interesting. It starts with this room with a bunch of lasers that you have to traverse around, the last one being on a moving platform. Then you get to this section where you need to use torches in order to orient yourself around these moving spike walls. Then you have to traverse through a room that has these flame pillars that follow a certain pattern that you have to notice in order to get through it safely. In the final room you have to kill three guardian scouts, the only challenge coming from the darkness. After this you get to the end and claim your spirit orb. It's probably my least favorite shrine on the Great Plateau, but that's not to say it's bad, just that it doesn't really have any interesting ideas outside of it being pitch black. After you complete all the shrines on the Great Plateau, you're sent on a mission to complete three shrines dedicated to a certain divine beast, with twelve in total. It first starts with you finding this strange pedestal that gives you the location of the shrines on these maps on the surfaces of the pedestal. You'll also meet up with Cavs, who just happens to be at the thing every time. There are different types of challenges that you have to do in order to open the shrine, one associated with each shrine. The way that you figure these challenges out are hints given to you by Cass. Let's start with a quest associated with Rivali. In Rito Village, you'll hear about a dragon in a canyon, so you'll go to investigate and find this Rito guard. From here, you just have to wait for the dragon to show up in the canyon around 1am. All you have to do from there is shoot its horn to reveal a shrine. The next trial is one of the ring trials with you needing to shield surf down the side of Hebra Mountain. It's pretty fun, mostly because of the shield surfing. Once you get to the end, the shrine reveals itself. The last of these trials is to shoot four targets at the flight range. Once again, this task is pathetically easy. I'd argue it's harder to get to the shrine after you hit the targets than it is to hit the targets. I will give it some credit though, since you do have to hit four whilst in bullet time mode, so it's a little tricky with stamina management. For Mipha's quest, you must first learn about the trials from Prince Sidon in Mipha's diary. After this, you'll get your first clue and head over to Oria's Grotto. From here, you'll get the hint that you need to glide down to the shrine at sunrise. It's not exactly subtle, but it works for what it is. The next trial is to just beat some guardians, there's literally nothing else to it. The last challenge also involves rings with you having to climb a waterfall and paraglide through them all. It's not quite as fun as Rivali's ring trial, but I guess it's fine otherwise. For Daruk's trial, the first trial you must overcome is to defeat an Igneo Talus Titan. Basically just a bigger version of the regular Igneo Talus. It's a pretty fun boss fight with these gusts of wind allowing you to glide up and use ice arrows to get onto him and to attack his ore vein. Not much else to it, just a fun fight. The next trial involves you having to scale Death Mountain to get through these rings. It's pretty fun and is the only one where I felt like the timer would be a little tight. The final trial has you having to survive Lava's fiery fate. Nice and vague, just the way I like it. Basically, you need to find a way to get to the center ring here. It involves you having to place a metal block underneath it and then finding a place where you can jump down and glide over to it. This is my favorite trial for Rudania because it uses navigational puzzle solving. With you knowing where you need to go, you just have to figure out how to get there. 
For Bosa's trial, your first trial is to kill a Muldu King, and once again, you can just stand around on these ruins and use the same strategy, except this time, it takes longer to kill. Using electric type weapons will make the fight a lot quicker though. The second trial is another ring one, this time using a sand steel to get through them all faster. I thoroughly enjoyed this one, it's about as fun as Rivali's ring quest. The final trial involves you going back through the Inga clan hideout, this time to get an orb. It's once again this stupid stealth section that shares the exact same problems as going through the Yiga Clan hideout normally. The ending almost makes up for it with you throwing the orb down the pit and these two adventurers getting really upset at you since the orb was going to be used to gain access to a treasure, not realizing that the treasure was a shrine. It's not enough to make up for the whole trial, but it is a charming ending. One last thing before we actually get to the shrines and how they're designed, I wanted to talk about my favorite part of these trials, that being that they aren't just random gameplay segments, but rather trials that the champions had to do. It contextualizes them and fits them organically into the world. And it's just something interesting that I thought of, it's another case that shows that at every point in this game, everything has a sense of logic and reasoning behind it. There's no gameplay for the sake of gameplay, there's a definitive reason behind everything. The rest of the DLC shrines, with one exception, are excellent and some of the best in the game. All of them are puzzle shrines, which makes actually going out of your way to complete them feel rewarding. Aim for Stillness is another shrine about air currents, though this is probably one of the weaker ones in the game due to how simple it is to solve. It does have a little bit of navigational puzzle solving, but there's not enough for the shrine to feel like it has substance. It's one of the weaker DLC shrines, which will become even more apparent the further we get into this section. Though it isn't a bad shrine. Master the orb has you need to guide this large orb down this course. You'll have to notice how the orb moves through the course and then use cryonis and stasis to allow it to get through the whole course without falling off of it. Once you've successfully done that, you just launch it over to its destination and go through the gate for your next emblem. It's not a difficult shrine, but it is pretty fun. The Four Winds is all about air currents and it is by far the best shrine for Marvali's quest. The whole shrine is about traversing through this thing. You need to use the air current in order to get access to different parts to activate certain switches. Some are easy like this one where you just have to go inside the structure, but some are trickier with you having to wait for the current to hit a windmill, opening a door, and shooting the switch before it closes. The whole thing is really satisfying to figure out and is one of my favorites. The melting point has you melting a series of ice blocks, but the puzzle element comes from the fact that you have to melt some of them only a little bit. The main section of the shrine has you melting some ice blocks to stand on in order to melt blocks higher up. However, depending on what method you're using to melt the blocks, it will melt both the ice you're standing on and the ice you actually need to melt. It's a fun little puzzle section overall. And the end has you needing to take a block in order to climb up this ledge since Cryonis won't give you enough height to get over the ledge. A very solid shrine. Support and Guidance is a very tricky shrine with you having to guide this orb down to its pedestal by using Cryonis. There's a lot of trial and error involved here, with you having to think about how the Cryonis pillars will affect how the orb moves through the path and what the optimal place to put them is. You can also stop the orb in place in certain areas, which would allow you to move certain pillars if need be. If you know what you're doing, then it's a very easy shrine, but if you're a moron like me who doesn't notice or remember basic things, then it's a very hard, very satisfying shrine to complete. Secret Stairway is about a secret stairway. There's this waterfall with metal boxes on rails. So your job is to move them in a way so that you can drop them onto a cryonis block to hold them in a certain position. It can be kind of tricky to get the timing down, but it's not a massive issue or anything. The main challenge comes from making the staircase the shrine is named after, and it requires a bit too much trial and error for my taste, uh, but it's a decent shrine overall. Moving targets is the worst DLC shrine. It starts out decent enough with you having to time when you detonate the bomb, and the challenge gets expanded upon in the classic Nintendo fashion, uh, but then you get to the end and it's an apparatus shrine because they just had to bring the worst type of shrine from the base game over to the DLC as well. It's really difficult to not only move it into the correct position, but it's also difficult to get a good grasp of the perspective so you could potentially set it too low or too high for the ball to hit the platform. It's incredibly frustrating and ruins what would have otherwise been a solid shrine. Blind Spots has you having to find different ways to avoid fire and other such stuff with, as the name would suggest, Blind Spots. First you go through this section where you have to avoid the fire by positioning yourself correctly on the cube. Then you have a similar section, but this time with spikes. Then you have this section with a bunch of guardian scouts you need to take care of to avoid getting knocked off the platform. Then you have to climb this waterfall to get to the monk. It's a pretty fun shrine and is a great palate cleanser after the abysmal shrine that came from earlier. 
block the blaze as you need to block a bunch of fire lines. For the first one, you just take this metal block to make a path through the fire, but the shrine isn't that simple for its entire duration. One of the puzzles has you need to place two blocks at a slant so you can have a safe passage underneath the flames. Then you have an apparatus section that's actually not that bad. It doesn't need to have precise positioning, so it's a lot easier to focus on just blocking the flames. Overall, a decently fun shrine. Big or small sees you in a long corridor, with you having to figure out how to activate this gate at the end of the corridor with this electric generator. It's a pretty fun electricity puzzle, and is yet another example of electricity puzzles being the best type in the entire game. There are a lot of different lines you need to connect, and there are only a few objects you can use to connect those lines, so the puzzle element comes from needing to find out how you can most efficiently connect them. There is one bad element of the shrine though, since yet again there's another apparatus puzzle. You move this laser around and your goal is to complete this power line by activating and deactivating these switches. Thankfully it's optional, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a terrible idea. I really do not understand their obsession with these motion control puzzles. It's one of the worst aspects of Skyward Sword as well, and I cannot for the life of me tell why on earth they thought bringing this garbage back would be a good idea. Dual Purpose is another shrine that has you solving an electricity puzzle involving you having to open a gate. It's a bit difficult for me to accurately describe, but I'll do my best. Basically, you're moving these cubes and trying to get them into correct positions. You're not only trying to open the gate though, you're also trying to get up so you can walk through the gate. So you have to move one block to somewhere in range before you ascend the staircase you make, and then move everything back in place in order to open the gate. To make things a little more complicated, some of the blocks are climbable and others aren't, so you have to take those into account as you move everything as well. It's a pretty fun shrine, not much else to it. The last shrine is easily my favorite, Inside the Box. It all involves you having to get these colored orbs into the correct pedestal. Uh, the solution is why I love it so much. There are these torches on the wall that denote a number, as well as these colored things I don't feel like learning the name of, so it's obvious that you need to place the orb in with the associated color and number. Uh, but there's no obvious way to get that number. Up a flight of stairs is another freaking apparatus puzzle, but it's the best one in the game by far. Basically, all you're doing is shaking the box around, and if you pay attention, then you'll notice multiple orbs inside of the box. Depending how many are in the box is the column that you need to place the orb. Figuring this out made me feel real smart, because the shrine is kind of designed in that way, because the solution is so creative that noticing it immediately fires the dopamine directly into your brain. It makes the shrine as a whole really stick out in my mind, by far my favorite DLC shrine and one of my favorites in the game in general. Not too surprising considering that it came from the quest tied to Vonda Boris. Before we get to the final section, I wanted to bring up the Illusory Realm fights. The reason I'm doing this here is because they're so closely tied to the Champion Trials and the Champion Trials are too closely tied to the shrines that it didn't make sense for it to be in any other section. There's also not that much to mention, but it wouldn't be an all encompassing retrospective if I ignored them. The fights are largely the same, though there are a few differences that make them more interesting than previously. Firstly, you have the champion abilities, Zerbosa's Fury and Durek's Protection being the most useful against them. Secondly, you're limited in what food you can eat, your armor, and your weapon and arrows. They're all a fair bit more difficult due to these changes, but there isn't that much actually changed about the fights in general. Water Blight Ganon's floor is a bit slower to move through, like you're traveling through mud or something. Fire Blight is still pathetically easy, Wind Blight is basically the same fight. And Thunderblight Ganon is actually a bit easier since if you perform the first half the same as usual, then you can backload a ton of Verbosa's Furies which just destroys him. The most interesting thing about these fights is how they're justified in the game. In a shocking move for Nintendo, they slightly characterize Link by saying that these Illusory Realm fights are actually a representation of the fear in his heart or something like that. It's interesting to think that these creatures disturb this slab of wood to the core uh, but considering how dirty the English localization team did to Link, I'll take it. Overall, the shrine and overall quests associated with them are fairly interesting and do a great job at doing what DLC should actually do, that being to expand the experience. But there's one more thing to talk about before we get to the conclusion. There are two main trials in the DLC for Breath of the Wild. The Trial of the Sword and a fifth Divine Beast, and I have no idea why it's called a Divine Beast, uh, probably just because it's another dungeon. It doesn't even get a proper name, you only learn it from the Igneotalus Titan and Maldu King you fight. 
it's pretty much just a glorified shrine rather than a huge creature, but sure game, I guess I'll let this one slide. But let's talk about the Trial of the Sword first. This is most comparable to the Savage Labyrinth from Wind Waker or Cave of Ordeals from Twilight Princess, a huge combat gauntlet where you go from floor to floor defeating and killing enemies. However, there are two main differences that make it a lot more enjoyable than those two previous gauntlets. Firstly, there are three different sets of rooms where you can save your progress, which means that if you die on floor 48, you won't have to start over from the very beginning. You do still have to do like 20 floors, so that element of stress as you try to survive is still there, but it's a lot more manageable and less overwhelming. Secondly, much like Eventide Island, when entering you lose all of your items, armor, and food. This means that you have to forage within the floors to find your weapons and food. You can't just rely on the overpowered goods that you've enjoyed throughout the game. The first set is 12 floors, the second 16, and the third 23 floors. The aesthetic is also a lot cooler than those other ones. Instead of just some boring, cold, stone dungeon look, it's a mix of the shrines in the wooded area. It gives everything this ethereal or ghostly vibe. It's visually distinct enough for it to have its own identity, but not so vastly different as to not fit in with the game's general aesthetic. Now onto the floors themselves. The first floor is pretty easy. It does a good job at establishing everything that you'll need to get good at in order to succeed on later floors. It shows that there's more to the trials than just beating the enemies. You have to explore the environments to find weapons, food, and other things like wood and cork leaves that are useful in later trials. The next floor, you'll learn a bit more about how enemies will position themselves in the world, along with different enemy types and how it will change your strategies. It continues like this, with it slowly ramping up in difficulty until you get to the first boss floor. This being the first boss floor, it's relatively easy. It's just a stone talus fight with limited weapons and food. After this, you get a breather room with some weapons and a bunch of food. Then you're thrown right back into another set of more difficult encounters with Lazalfos. Naturally, there's a bunch of electric type enemies and a series of rooms with water. This is where things actually start to get a little difficult, since the Lazalfos are the most despicable scumbags known to man here for some reason. And as some sort of reference to the first game, Wizrobes in this instance are kind of stupidly difficult for someone who sucks at video games, uh, such as me. After this escalating difficulty, you come across another boss, this time a Hinox. Once again, it's just the same fight, but now you have less weapons. After this, you'll get to the middle trials, which are more of the same, but with a different theme for the environments being more focused on platforms, rather than the basic forest-esque theme from the beginning trials. There's a lot of rooms where you need to make sure you remain on the move because of enemies with arrows. It's a little overwhelming, but nothing too mean. Then you get a few of these pitch black rooms, a few rooms with increasingly difficult guardian scouts. Then you get to the final trials, also known as actually impossible in master mode. Maybe you could get through them, but I've never been able to, and I don't want to spend 20 hours doing something I don't want to do. The first room is filled with metal weapons, but naturally there's a thunderstorm. There's a storm going on for the first few floors, and then when you get to the style knocks, the next few floors are all about rocks and lava. Then you get some icy terrain, followed by areas that are a little more reminiscent of Hyrule in general, with ruins and such. For most of these floors, it's just a lot of difficult enemy encounters, not much to really talk about. Uh, the final level is definitely the hardest one, with you having to take care of a guardian turret, a wide-maned lionel, as well as a horde of bokoblins riding horses. If you strategically use some of the ancient arrows you got throughout this section, you can pretty easily kill him with an ancient arrow. After this, you get your reward for completing this challenge, which is a fully powered master sword. Instead of only doing 60 damage around Malice and Guardians, it now does it all the time. It does still become unavailable, but otherwise you now have the best weapon in the game. Overall, I like this trial. It's fun and it requires you to think about how you approach combat. Uh, but now into the best part of the DLC, the Divine Trial, otherwise known as Divine Beast Tamar. After you complete all 16 of the DLC shrines, you'll be summoned back to the Shrine of Resurrection for one final trial. And it is by far the best dungeon in the game. Because the game knows that you've already completed the other Divine Beasts, it means it can actually be kind of difficult. And it just blows the rest of them out of the water. Much like the regular Divine Beast, the dungeon moves, this time having this gear turn clockwise or counterclockwise. The terminals are all in different rooms that splinter out from the central corridor. So the main puzzle is trying to figure out how to get this gear to affect these rooms. Some puzzles are easy, like using Magnesis to push this block into this hole, but others are a bit trickier, like you having to find out where to put this metal bar. The puzzles in the actual rooms, once you actually do it, are pretty good too. They even have something to do with a certain divine beast in the game, which is pretty cool. 
The fire room has this ball puzzle where you need to time when to get it into this track using the movement of the dungeon to try and move it to the other side of the room. There's this room where you have to put this metal bar here to make the rest of the room move so you can glide over to the terminal. But the best room is the water room because of course it is. You first need to push up this pin to make a platform move along with the rest of the dungeon. Then you glide over to the main part of the room, with you having to make this sprigate looking thing move so you can stop this spout from filling up the room with water. Then you have to get this ball over to the other side to turn the spigot so that water can come out of this spout here. This allows you to activate the terminal and leave. It sounds easy, but the actual process of trying to solve this room is what makes it so much fun. It's the room that stuck the most in my mind as I was writing this section. Uh, but those are just the puzzles, there's also the aesthetics of the dungeon, which are phenomenal. It looks the same as a regular shrine, but it also has a lot of elements of design taken from the Divine Beasts, which leads to an interesting combination of the two. And the music is great as well. It takes the bass shrine theme, but it adds some strings, piano, percussion, and a choir that slowly builds up throughout the dungeon, which gives it a real sense of finality to the game. Oddly enough, it does a better job at it than Hyrule Castle, but maybe that's just me. Overall, one of my favorite dungeons in the entire series. It is really good. Now, remember earlier in the video when I stated that Thunderblight Ganon was the hardest boss in the base game and how Calamity Ganon was my favorite in the base game? That's because Monk Moskosia is the hardest boss and my favorite in the game in general. But he was added in the DLC. He is a really fun boss with a very epic piece of music. Now, there are several phases, all of them adding up to a really engaging fight that's constantly keeping you on your toes with you always having to be ready for whatever attack he does next. Urbosa's Fury is relatively ineffective on him, best used if you need to stun him for a moment. His first phase has him mostly just dashing at you, but once you get to a quarter of his health down, the fight becomes a lot more interesting as he creates a bunch of clones of himself. I don't really like this phase as much as the other ones. Uh, there's a lot of dodging you have to do as well as needing to attack every clone in order to find the real one that makes it a bit of a repetitive slog. But the rest of the fight is so fun that it's more of a minor inconvenience than anything else. Once he gets down to half health, he becomes a giant and starts sending a bunch of those spiked balls at you. After they land, you need to grab one and then bring it up to him so he'll shock himself, much like Thunderblight Ganon. Then he'll start to tilt the arena while sending more spiked balls down. At the end of the fight, he'll summon more clones of himself at you, or fire a laser at you. Overall, the fight is very engaging and is a definite highlight of the game for me. Overall, the Trial of the Sword and Tamar provide very fun experiences that expand the dungeon-y content of the game, as well as being some of the most challenging and rewarding experiences in the series. These are what makes the DLC worthwhile. Now let's finally wrap this thing up. Breath of the Wild is a game that I come back to time and time again. It's also a game that I've had a lot to say about. From the engaging exploration experience, to the attention to detail in every aspect, to the ways that they attempted to reinvent the dungeons, every aspect of this game comes together to craft one of the greatest gaming experiences of the last decade. It ditched a lot of what made the Zelda series so special for a lot of people. And this whole thing could balloon out into an entire discussion about what even makes a Zelda game a Zelda game, uh, but I'll save that for a later day. Besides, that conversation takes away what made this game so special. Its boldness to depart from traditions, to try new things, is commendable. Its laser-focused vision on exploration over anything else may make things like the story a little underwhelming, even if I liked it. And it may also negatively impact the dungeons. But to be so committed to a certain idea has always been something that Zelda has done. So, yes, Breath of the Wild is a quote-unquote true Zelda game. Not everything it does works, but there's a reason so many praised it. Why it won Game of the Year. Why I put 500 hours into it, played through it at least 10 times, and will continue to do so in the future. It's a special game that only comes once in a blue moon. A game that takes the gaming world by storm. A game that is constantly cited as a source of inspiration for other series to massively shake up from the status quo, and that it is successful if they do it right. For all these reasons and more, it's no wonder why Breath of the Wild is Nintendo's masterpiece.